Note, most of this video uses Google Colab as an environment. Simply go to colab.research.google.com, create a new notebook, and that's all you need to set up. Now it's some weird convention that whenever anyone is using a new programming language or environment, we generally try to output the text hello world in that programming language. So we will do that in Python by clicking in here and we will write P-R-I-N-T for print. We will write a round bracket like this, a double quote, and then the text hello world. We'll put another double quote, the other round bracket so it kind of sandwiches it in like that, hold shift, press enter, and that outputs the text, hello world. So the reason that we needed these double quote things is because this is how we signal to Python that whatever's between it is text. And so you can see what gets outputted. It doesn't actually have the quotations. And that's because we are using these things to tell Python that between them, it is text. And so what actually gets outputted is just the text itself, not it with the quotes. If you did want the quotes, well, you'd have to tell Python that. It's like, hey, I'll use these quotes to say that this is text, and then I'll have quotes in here. See a quote there and a quote there. Well, that shows, hey, I need the text of quote, hello world quote, and so it prints that for you. In Python, there's really no difference between the double quotes and the single quotes. And I can show you that if I instead just remove these double quotes entirely, well, that is going to do the same thing as the beginning because the single quotes also are saying to Python, hey, what's ever between these two things, that is text as well. So we just get outputted, hello world. And so if you wanted to display double quotes in the output, well, we could put that within here because if I have double quote and then double quote between the single quotes, well, the single quotes are still telling to Python what's between this is text. And so, okay, the double quotes, I'm gonna treat that as text. If I hold shift, press enter, it outputs it with the double quotes. Python printing is pretty powerful. You can even put numbers in here if you wanted because it just treats whatever letter on the keyboard or number on the keyboard you put in there as text. And so if I wanted to do hello world and then seven, and I'm gonna remove those double quotes because it's a little annoying to look at. Hello world seven, it's totally happy with that. You put in the number, it treated it as text. And so it can output both text like in letters and numbers as well. A big reason why I use Google Colab instead of some of the other environments like VS Code or PyCharm for most of my coding is that we don't actually need the print function to print things in Colab. If you wanted to just print all of this text, well, if you copied that, pasted it in a new cell here, and then ran that, well, it's going to output that by default for you. That is because it was on the last line. If we instead had, say, two different things, we will put up here, it's gonna do hello world, I'll put eight. It technically is gonna go top to bottom. It's going to run this, but we didn't print it, so it's not really gonna do anything with it. It's basically just gonna forget that it even happened. Hello world eight, and then at the bottom, well, I left it as the last line here, and so it again, if I ran that, it is going to output that same thing back. Notice that if you print it this way, it is going to include the quotes, so they show up there, but if you print with the print function, it is not going to print the quotes. It's not really a big deal, it's just a small nuance to how Colab works, you don't have to worry about that. So you'll probably see me flip-flop between using the print function to print and just leaving it at the last line to print. There's times when you'd wanna do each and I'll choose between. Now you or I would think of this as text. Hello world seven is text. Hello world eight is text. A password, your name or a sentence, whatever you wanna put in there, we think of it as text. But to Python, it actually thinks of this as what we call a string. So this is actually in Python context, the string of hello world seven. So if I were to copy this and I were to put it down here, similarly to how print takes whatever it is and then outputs that, well type, this is going to output, not type as in type on the keyboard, the category of something. And there's a bunch of different Python categories and we'll look at those type and then just that same text there, hello world seven, it doesn't return text, it returns str, which is short for string. So it's saying that this text here, or the string, this is the string of Hello World 7. You might be wondering what's the difference and why are we calling it that? 
This is just sort of a design decision that dates back many years, and so we use the word string instead of text. It doesn't really matter. It's how we store text. We store text in strings, but you're gonna hear the word string both in Python and Java and C and C++, all these other languages, you will see text as strings, and it's almost always stored or signaled by single quotes, double quotes, or both. Now, so far, we've only seen kind of stupid sentences like hello world seven, which really doesn't have any meaning. I do want to show you most of the time you're going to be outputting stuff and inputting stuff that actually makes sense. So like my, that's not my, my name is Greg and I am 23 years old. That is also currently correct. So if I run that, it outputs, you know, a proper sentence. This is more along the lines of what you'll actually do with Python. I want to now isolate the number that was in that text. So we had, my name is Greg and I am 23 years old. What if I just had simply the text of 23? So that's also the string of 23. We output that. Sure, it's okay. That's the text of 23. But this is extremely different to if you had just 23 without the quotes. Note that it's covering it in green here. If we output that, it again outputs it without the quotes. This is the number of 23. This is the string or text of 23. So you might be wondering like, what really is the difference here? Well, the difference is that if you were to add say four to this, 23 plus four, you'd expect that to be probably 27, except it's not. This is actually 234. And that's because if you take one sequence of characters and you add another sequence of characters, the more logical thing for Python to do is just to put that second sequence of characters after the first. You said, say, hello, and then you added world. Well, that would be hello world. Hello, and then world. So plus, and then I'm going to put a space there, world. Well, that is hello and then world. It's the same thing with numbers in text here because if you put quotes around things, that means these are strings. I'm gonna treat them as text. And if you have numbers, well, it's gonna treat them as numbers. If you try to do this plus four, that equals 27. That's the number of 23 plus the number of four that mathematically is going to equal 27. And if you try to do things with strings like say subtraction, if you try to do hello and then you subtract it, we'll just say hi, for example. Well, Python has absolutely no idea what you're talking about. If you take one sequence of characters and you try to subtract another one, you know, maybe there's some really weird thing you could think of, but there's really no logical thing it would do by taking one sequence and subtracting another sequence. It just says unsupported operand types for minus string and string, the operand, so operand, that's referring to this thing here, this operand subtraction here, that is unsupported between a string and a string. It doesn't make sense for strings. This was our first example of an error in Python. It's something we did wrong and so we broke Python. It's telling us what we did wrong. It says type error, this minus operator was not allowed to perform between a string and another string. It's okay with it for numbers. If we did three minus two, well, we're gonna get one. It's okay for an integer. This actually is an integer. It's okay between an integer and another integer, but between strings, that's not allowed. The term for this is Python through an error. Basically, when we did this line, it didn't understand what we did. It had a problem with it and it threw this error. Well, what that means basically is that it halts execution. It outputs this for us and it halts execution. If we had another line here, print and then hi. Well, if we ran all of this, well, what it's trying to do is this and then that, but we don't see the high down here. We don't see that it printed high because this threw an error. It broke and it halted Python. It said, no, 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 you did something wrong. I am going to stop, tell you what you did wrong and not do anything else. In this particular example, we threw what was called a type error. Over here, it's telling us the category of the error, and it was a type error. It had problem with types, but this is not the only possible type of error we could get. We could also get a syntax error. By just changing this to a plus, well, we're okay with that because it runs hello plus hi. That's fine, it makes hello hi. It kind of discards that. It's not really gonna do anything with it. And then we print hi. Well, that's fine with all of that. 
Well, we can get a syntax error with just removing that quote there. So what happens is Python has really no idea what this thing is. And so if we were to run this, it breaks again. It says syntax error, end of line while scanning string literal. Technically what this is, is called a string literal. And here it, you know, it doesn't really know what it is. And so it hit a syntax error. Syntax is essentially the set of rules that you have to abide by to operate that language. I'm speaking English right now, and it has its own set of rules, like, you know, 26 different letters. We also allow like double quotes and single quotes when you're writing text. And when I'm saying it aloud, you know, I'm following a particular set of rules. With Python, it is its own, you know, computer language. It's still a language. And so you have to operate within its rules. One of its rules is that if you are trying to store strings or things in quotes, well, then you have to have two of those. You have to wrap it in these quotes. Otherwise, it says you are not following the rules. I'm going to break and throw a syntax error. I do not understand what you're doing. You have to fix this. It's going to tell you what's wrong if you fix that. And if you say, OK, well, if you hit end of line while scanning string literal, don't really worry about that end of line thing. It's telling us we need to do this. And if we do that, it will again do this line. It's OK with that. It will proceed to then do this line. And then we are all good to go. So as I mentioned briefly in there, this number here, 3 minus 2 is 1 or 3 and 2. Any of those numbers here, they are all integers. And so if we were to ask the type, if we again wrote type of, say, 3, well, the type of 3 is it just writes an int. That's short for an integer. An integer in mathematics and in Python is basically a number that is a whole number. And so it's not 3.2, 4.7. If we did have those numbers, we could write them like 3.2. Well, it would still output the same way, like 3.2, except the type of that, the type of 3.2 and any other decimal number is what we call a float or a floating point number. So using both of these types of numbers, integers and floats, we can do quite a bit of mathematics. Let's look at all of the common operations. Well, we've already seen we can do 3 plus 2, and that is equal to 5. If you were to ask the type of this thing, the type of 3 plus 2, well, in here, this is actually going to convert to 5, and then we're asking the type of 5. Well, it's still a whole number, and so that's an integer. If we were to do addition with floating point numbers, say 3.2 plus 4.7, well, that equals 7.9. And so if you were to ask the type of this thing, well, again, in here, in the middle, 3.2 plus 4.7 converts to 7.9. We're asking the type of another decimal number that's still a float. So with integers, we can also do subtraction. 4 minus 3, we saw, would be equal to 1. We could do subtraction between floating point numbers. 3.2 minus 1.0 is equal to 2.2, still a floating or decimal number. We could do multiplication and division. So if you did 4 times 3, that is equal to 12. That would be an integer. If you did multiplication with floating point numbers, 2.1 times 3.2. Well, that one's a little bit hard to do in your head, but it is 6.72, blah, 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 1. That's probably an approximation. It only stores a given amount of digits, which we're not going to go into. It stores enough digits for it to be pretty darn accurate. And that, if you ask the type of that, that would be a float as well. When we do division, things will look a little bit different. So if we have the integer 4 and divide that, so that's slash sign, 4 divided by 3, that is equal to a floating point number. So this one actually took integers and it converted that to a floating point number. And that's because because of this division, you know, 3 does not go evenly into 4. It goes into 4 once, what's left over is 1, but it doesn't really do that long division. It doesn't return like 1, for example. It returns 1.333. That is the actual fraction if you were to do it, you know, just looking at a fraction. If you do fractions in mathematics, this is equal to 1.3 repeating. And eventually, you know, it's actually going to cut this off. Technically, what this is equal to is, you know, 1.3 repeating infinitely. It actually keeps only a set of decimal numbers. You know, it keeps like 20 digits or whatever it is. It's not going to store the number infinitely, but this is easily enough to be extremely close to the proper fraction of 4 divided by 3. And actually, even if you did have a fraction that was, say, 1 divided by 1, well, that should equal just 1 but it actually equals 1.0 in Python. And so what they're doing here, if you do this slash, this normal division symbol, if you do that, no matter what you do, you will return a floating point number. 
Even if the fraction works out perfectly, one goes into one exactly once, it does not return the integer one, it returns the floating point of 1.0. So it's still equal to one, but it is returning a decimal number. And if you instead did it with floating point numbers, you had say 3.2 and divided that by 1.6, well we know that's equal to two, but this is actually equal to 2.0 for the same reason. If you did want to do what we'll call integer division, that is actually given by the two slash symbol. So if we did three and then slash slash, so three integer division by two, well that would return, it's actually returning one. Now is that the remainder? Because when you divide three by two, it goes into three once, and then there's remainder one, so there's two ones there. This is actually just the number of times it goes into three. So we can see that if we did five divides by two, that is equal to two because two goes into five twice, that then is equal to four and there's remainder one, but it's not giving you that remainder. If you wanted that remainder, that would be five. Usually we say mod, but it's the percent sign, five mod or modulo two, that is equal to one because it's saying do the long division, do five divides by two, well two goes into five twice and then there's remainder one, this is actually equal to that remainder. And so if you had say seven mod three or three, then you would get just one. Three goes into seven twice, remainder one. And so percent is for the long division and then you get the remainder. And then the double divides is saying do the long division, but say how many times that number went into the other number. So admittedly division's a little weird in Python, but it is exactly what we want. If you want the remainder, you would use the percent or modulo sign. If you would want to do integer division, we're calling it that because you know you have integers and you return an integer with division. So if you wanted how many times this number goes into that number, you'd use the double divides. And if you wanted to just do normal division, whether it's you know whole numbers, it's gonna do the division and return a floating point number. Or even if you wanted to do it with floating point numbers, it's still going to do the division and return a floating point number. So normal division, you know, you're fine whether they're integers or not. Double division, like integer division, usually, you know, everything's an integer. And here the remainder or modulo, everything's an integer as well. The last common mathematical symbol we're going to cover is exponentiation. So if you were to do five squared, well, that is technically equal to just to five times five. And so that's equal to 25. Except what if you wanted five cubed? That's equal to five times five times five. Well, again, you could just write that and that's five cubed. But as the number starts to get up there, you'd rather do something like five to the power of three. Okay, so this is equal to the same thing. What this double star is equal to, this is equal to multiplication kind of over and over again. So it's five times times three or five to the power of three. That means five times five times five we do that three times. So you might have expected that symbol to be five to the power of three because on calculators or just in math, we often write it like that, except that actually isn't really equal to what you'd expect. Five, this thing three, that's equal to six. Yeah, we're not gonna cover that. Moving on from math for now, we're going to talk about the extremely important concept of a variable. And before we talk about variables, we have to talk about names very quickly. So a name in Python, well, it's something that it recognizes, just a bunch of words or letters that mean something. And so print, well, we saw in Python, it already knew what print was, print's a function. And so if we were to output this, well, it says, hey, it's a function that prints. We don't need to worry about the word function for now, it's a big deal, but all that we need to know right now is that P-R-I-N-T, that actually has meaning to Python. But if you do P-R-I-N-T-T, -T, well, it says, hey, name error, uh, print is, is not defined. We don't know what that means. By default, P-R-I-N-T has been given meaning. P-R-I-N-T-T -T has not been given meaning. We can make what's called a variable. It's essentially adding a new name into the system, and we're going to give that name meaning. It's called a variable. So, for example, we could make something called y. That's often used in math for like the output variable. By default, y does not have any meaning. We get the same error, name error, name y is not defined. We will add y into the system with this equals thing. So y equals, we'll let it be the number five. And if we output y then, well, it's fine with that because we put y into the system here. We said, hey, y, you are going to be equal to five. And so when we ask what y is, well, y is five, so it returns five. The reason we call y a variable is because y can vary. 
Right now, while it started as 5, it didn't exist before, then we set it equal to 5, and so it outputted 5. But we could also change its value. We could make y equal to 4. And so if you were to output y, while it's no longer 5, it is 4, so we see the value of 4. The following does not apply to many programming languages, but for Python in particular, it is totally okay for y to actually change data type. So y is an integer 5, and then y is an integer 4, and actually, you could even make y equal to the string of, say, tree. And then if we output y, it is the string of tree. It can change to whatever you want it to be. It might not yet be apparent as to why variables are useful, because if you wanted to change the value of them every time, well, we're just setting it equal to something, and then we're setting it equal to something else. Well, why is that any better than just having existent, you know, tree and four whenever you would want those things? Well, we're going to see in about five minutes or so. We first have to talk about these things called booleans, or actually it's just called a bool, which is short for boolean. A boolean or bool is a data type in Python, just like a string or an int or a floating point number is a data type. A boolean or bool is a data type in Python. As opposed to strings or numbers, which can really take an infinite number of values, you could have, you know, this text and you could have, you know, so many like infinitely possible combinations of different texts. And same with numbers, a boolean has strictly two different possible values. A boolean is either true, which is exactly this written precisely like that, or it is false, which is written precisely like that. Note that this is extremely different from the text, or if we put it in quotes, this is already implying a string. So if you write true like this, that is completely different to this true. This is true, the Boolean. This is false, the Boolean. This here, this is simply just text. Like if you wanted to say aloud the word true, then sure, we would need a way to do that. And you would have it in quotes like this, but that's a string. These are Booleans, and I could prove that with type of true, that is equal to a bool. It's just short for Boolean. It is really an on-off switch. True implies the switch is on, and false implies the switch is off. Before we talk about that switch thing, which I just said, we're gonna get there very shortly. I want to show other ways to get to true or to get to false. So what I mean by that is there's really only two different possible values for a Boolean, it's true or false. But things can produce true, or you could think of it as things can be true. For example, four less than three, is that true or is that false? Well, four is less than three, no it's not. Four is actually greater than three in reality. So if you run and output this, that says false because what you said here, this is just not true. If you're not true, you're false. If you're not false, you're true. That might have been a little bit confusing. So if you're not true, you're false. This actually, even in Python, is a thing. You can use the not operator like that, not true. This must evaluate to false, because if there's only two possible values for a Boolean, if you are not true, well, what must you be? You must be false. And if you are not false, again, there's only two possible values, well, if you're not false, then you must be true. So we can also use this not operator, which just flips things around. The one we saw up here, this what we call a comparison operator, this is the less than symbol. Or in terms of the perspective, you could also think of it as the greater than symbol, but I like to think of it as reading left to right. And so it is pointing to the smaller number. No, it's actually not in this case. It's pointing to the bigger number, hence this thing is false. But in the mathematical operator, what it must do is point to the smaller number and open its mouth per se to the bigger number. And so why is this false? Well, this is, we wrote this wrong. Four less than three, four is not less than three, that is false. And so if you instead had it the other way, if you wrote it like this, four greater than three, well, this now aligns with the proper mathematics. Yes, four is greater than three. And so this is what we say logically, it is logically true. Same like the previous, the previous was logically false. Four less than three, that is not true, that is false. Four greater than three, that is logically true. You can also add the equal sign to any of these. I'm gonna leave that and go down and say three is greater than or equal to. So if you put the equals to after that, three greater than equal to two, well, is that true or false? 
Well, three is actually strictly bigger than two. It is actually bigger than two. And so that evaluates to true. We could again flip this and say three less than or equal to two. Well, this is not logically true. Three is actually bigger than two. And so this is going to be false. Those examples didn't really use the equals thing though. We didn't need it. If you instead had two is less than or equal to two, well, it's two is less than or equal to two. And so yes, two is actually equal to two. Therefore, two is less than or equal to two because it's equal to two. And so this is going to evaluate to true. Same thing if we flipped this sign here, is two greater than or equal to two? Well, it's still equal to two, so these are both true. Very similar to the not, but in a different way. We could also do two is not equal to three. Well, what is this saying? Okay, two is not equal to three. Well, yeah, actually that's logically true because two is not equal to three. The exclamation here with the equals implies not equals, two not equal to three, yeah, that's logically true. Two is a different number than three. If you instead flipped that and did three is not equal to two, so we just put the numbers the other way, well, that doesn't do anything. There's no sort of direction implied here. That is gonna be the same thing, and that also evaluates to true. The final and most common one here we haven't seen yet, three equals equals two, okay? So before, if you just had three equals two, basically what that would try to do is set three equal to two. Because if you remember, if we had x here, that would try and set x equal to two. Well, if you just did three equals two, like it is in some languages, well, this is actually gonna throw an error. It says can't assign to a literal, these three or this two here, those are considered literals. And so we can't assign to three. We can't set three equal to two here, like we're trying to. We actually need another equals sign. And now it's telling Python that, hey, we actually meant, are you checking that three is equal to two? Is three equal to two? That's how you should read this. Three is not equal to two. Three is a different number than two. And so this is logically false. We could also do this for strings and not just for numbers. Hey, is the string of hi equal equal to the string of hello? Well, no, those are different words. That's a different sequence of characters. And so those aren't the same thing. But if you said high is equal equal to high, well, yeah, that's true because they're the same word. Most of the time, if you're not dealing with numbers and you do need to check like one of these comparison operators here, it's comparison because we're comparing the left side to the right side. If you do need to use one of these comparisons with something that's not like a number, well, most of the time it's just gonna be checking equality like this. Technically, this actually has meaning high is greater than high. It has to do with the alphabet, but we're not really gonna worry about that. All of these comparison operators where we have checking equality of strings, equality of numbers, of course, they would also work for floating point numbers as well, 3.2 greater than five. That is logically false. It works for them as well, but all of this stuff is turning into a Boolean. It's either logically true or logically false. This is why we need Booleans, not because we want to literally write the word true and have it spit out true or false, it's because things naturally are true and false. So now we're ready to talk about if statements, where an if statement is either on if it is true and it is off if it is false. So we can make an if statement with if and then some condition. That's really just another term for a Boolean. So we'll do if true for now and then colon if we press enter, you'll see that it automatically indents our next level of code. So it puts a couple of spaces here. Don't worry about the exact indentation for all the different environments. Just do what it says, do what it suggests. If we back up here and press enter, then that's the right thing that it wants us to do. We will just write some code here and print one to show what this thing is doing. If we were to run this, this does print one, meaning that this part is executed. But note that if I change this to if false, then nothing happens when we run the code. So that's why I'm referring to this if statement as basically an on off switch. This turns off the switch. This means that this will not get executed. And if it was true, then that means it were to be executed. And if we had multiple lines here in the indentation, note again, if I press enter at this, it'll keep that level of indentation. If I do print two here, well, that still, both of them are going to get executed when we run that because it says, oh, this is true. Well, I'm going to run the indented code and then it does that one, then it does that one, and then it's done. Again, if I were to change this to false, 
then neither of these things are ran because both are in this level of indentation. It says, nope, I will not do either of those. I will jump out to this level of indentation. And so note that no matter whether the if is true or false, this print three here, this is going to be run after all of this stuff. So here, just the print three is ran because the if statement was not activated, the indented code was never ran. It jumps out and then it says, oh, I'm gonna print three. If this were true, well, then it's going to do the executed code and then jump out and print three. So we'll see one, then two, then three. Most of the time, it's not very interesting if we just had if true or if false here. This is just for demonstrational purposes for showing how this works. More so, it's going to be, say, a condition, like say three is greater than seven. Well, if that evaluates to true, well, then this is going to run, except this is going to evaluate to false. So what we're gonna see here is then just the three, because that is now false. But if we instead had a true evaluation up here, if this were say, if eight is greater than seven, that is true, then it does like before, one, then two, then three. Although this is maybe closer to actual code we might write, this really still doesn't make much sense until you use variables, because again, their values may vary. And that means that this may evaluate to true or false given different circumstances. So if we had a variable, I'm gonna make one at x equals seven, and then we will make this if x is greater than seven. Well, what happens if I run this? Well, x is seven, which is not greater than seven, so this is false, and so this is the only thing that's activated. But say in a different scenario, we actually made x equal to nine. Well, in that circumstance, then nine is greater than seven, x is greater than seven, and so all three of these will be activated. Instead, we are gonna talk about how to store multiple pieces of information, because say that you had you know, a list of grocery items, and you wanted to store that. Well, of course, what you could do is say, have each of them as a variable. You could say banana is equal to just the string of banana. And then you could have say orange is equal to the string of orange or something like that, except that's not really very useful. What we want is, you know, a grocery list where we have say a grocery list and then I'm gonna use some new piece of notation here, square brackets, so similar to the opening then closing round brackets, we're gonna have opening and closing square brackets like this, and in between these square brackets, we will list our items. So we'll do the same, banana, and then orange. And then what we just did here is make a list where it has those objects in order. If we were to output grocery list, well, that actually is, and you can read it in Python as the list of banana and then orange. Now, if you did forget a grocery item, you could always put that on the end of your list here, like say blueberries, and then that will show up in the list. But that's a little bit different than saying you have a grocery list and then you're adding an item to it. What we really did here is we actually just forgot about the old grocery list and we made a new one and we set that equal to banana, then orange, then blueberries. We can add a list item keeping our existing list with grocery list dot append and then we will put the string of we'll just say fruit which is a little bit weird because we specified the fruit earlier it's just for fun we run that and it doesn't look like anything happened although we got a check mark meaning that you know nothing failed if we were to look at grocery list well yes it actually did put fruit at the end of that list i'm saying list not only because we actually made a grocery list because the type of this thing actually is a list if we do type of you know anything in square brackets like this, this is actually just the empty list. It's the list with no items. The type of this list is, well, it's a list. And if we did the type of our grocery list, well, that is still, it's a list. Lists in Python are crazy powerful. We've only seen the bare bones of what you can do with them, just storing items. Well, their main object or purpose is to store items, but it's usually about actually retrieving those items and doing something with them. For example, we could loop over the items in the list one by one, doing four, we'll just say item in the grocery list. And then similar to the if statement, we put a colon here, What's that mean? When we press enter, it's going to indent. What we'll do here is print the item. And so what this does when we run it, it goes through one by one and it says item is first going to be banana. And so it prints the item, which is banana. And then it goes through the grocery list again, but it starts at the next element. We've already done banana, items already been banana. Now item is going to be orange. 
and so we print orange. And then the same thing, we then print blueberries, then fruit, then four, because each time we're getting item in the grocery list, four item in the grocery list, or you can read that in English as for each item in the grocery list and in order, you can see how it's preserving the order like that, for each item in the grocery list, print the item. And so that's what it does. As we mentioned, the list preserves order. So it's the list of banana, then orange, then blueberries, then fruit. If it feels like I'm just killing it for saying that for no reason, here's why. This part is a little bit confusing. Just look at the syntax and I'm not gonna explain it until you see it. Grocery underscore list sub, I usually say this is sub, but it's square brackets, zero. And then if I run this, this gets banana, which happens to be the first item. If I were to replace this with one, this gets orange, which is the second item. Two, you could probably guess that is blueberries. Three, you could probably guess that is fruit. Four, you could probably guess that is this four here. Five, well, that better be an error because we've run out of elements that it list index out of range. We ran out of elements. It goes from zero up until one minus the number of elements. One, two, three, four, five things. Five minus one is four. And so the last valid, we saw the word index is four. We call this idea here indexing and we call the number the index. You can kind of think of it as like a phone index. It's like a lookup, except it's an ordered lookup. What's first in the index? Well, why the heck is that zero and not just one? Well, it turns out some programming languages, they'll do something very similar and they'll make indexing where one is the first element. But one here is the second element. It's this orange right here. It's not the first, it is the second, zero is the first. You can think of this as basically the number is an offset or you know away from the first. Zero is the first and then one, well that's actually one away from the first. This is the first, one away from the first, that is what gets you orange. This dates back many years to like C or C++, you know, maybe even before that, I'm not totally sure. It takes a long time to get used to this and to switch between different programming languages that it goes from zero is the first, and that means that the last valid one, zero, one, two, three, four, that is equal to number of things, five minus one, which is four. The last valid thing is four, and five would be an error. It takes some getting used to, but trust me with time, this will become natural. So we can actually loop through the elements. We call this a loop here, because we're looping through the elements we can loop through these elements of the list a slightly different way, where if we go through the indexes or the indices, so we can do for i, often when we're going through indexes, like if we have a variable that's going to, we'll see increase by one each time to be a valid index of the list, for i in, well, what's the valid list of indices? It is the list of zero and one, two, three, and four. Those are the valid indices for our list. Remember, zero, one, two, three, four. So if we do for i in that list, well then each time i is going to be, you know, the next index. At first it's zero, then one all the way up till four. So if we do print grocery list sub, I again usually read it as sub, sub i, and then print that, that's the same thing as before. It's really, you know, the same thing as for item in the grocery list, because item, or we're now replacing it with i, really, this is the same as item. It's grabbing the appropriate list item from its index using i, and we'll print that, and it's going to output the exact same thing. This was great, but it's a little bit clunky because we had to actually write the list out here. I'll show you first, we can magically replace this with the range of five, and then that will do exactly the same thing. So what is this range doing? Range is essentially producing the list, starting at zero and including zero, going up until this number minus one. And so that is what we needed. We needed the list of zero, one, two, three, and four in order. Range five is really doing that. And I can show you, we actually need to convert it to a list because just outputting range of five, that outputs back in Python as range of zero to five. If we convert this to a list, and we can do that with list of range of five, we run that, 
it is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, like we wanted. Now the reason that this is a thing in Python, and we'll see it all over the place in a bit, is because instead of putting the actual number here, we can just do the range of the length, well, we have to see this first, the length of the grocery list, that is equal to what? Five. That is the number of things that are in the list. One, two, three, four, five items are in the list. The len, which is short for length, of the list produces five. So that means we can combine these things and putting the range of the length of grocery list. This inner thing is the exact same thing as it is down here. It's just the length of the grocery list, which we know this will be replaced with five. So then we're getting the range of five. And so this is going to be, and that's an unexpected AOF. That's what happens when you don't put another bracket there. Another bracket, it produces zero, one, two, three, four, just like we wanted. So we don't have to do this clunky thing. and We don't have to know beforehand the number of items. We can always just do the range of the length of the grocery list. And then that'll automatically go through the items, get the right index, get the grocery item, print that, and then that's the same thing. Now, I wouldn't blame you for wondering, hey, why are we doing all of this index stuff? Why aren't we just using this nice four item in grocery list? It looks beautiful, it's nice and easy. When you can, absolutely do that. I guess just take my word for it for now that knowing about this index thing, it does come in handy and there are times when you'd want to use it. Sometimes, maybe even you want both methods where you have an index that goes through the items, you can grab the item like that, or you have a variable that just goes through and is the appropriate list item automatically. And sometimes you don't even know which one you're gonna need beforehand. Either way, something very useful is for i, and then we'll do item in the enumerate, we enumerate the grocery list. And so if I were to print i, and you can actually do a comma, we haven't seen this before, you can print multiple things, print i, and then item like that, that is going to print the index along with its appropriate item. And so it's zero with banana, one in orange, two in blueberries, three in fruit, four, and we put a four there as well. Before I show the next type of loop, which is called a while loop in Python, we need to look at something called incrementing and decrementing. And it's really easy. If you had a variable, say i equal to an integer, usually we're talking about the start of an index here, which is always gonna be zero. The index zero will always be the first of any list. And so i equals zero. If we did i plus equals one, what this is saying is i is equal to whatever i was plus one. Since i started at zero, i plus equals one says, hey, i is zero plus one, which is one. And so here i will be one. We could do this again, i plus equals one down here. i was previously one, as we see here. i plus equals one, and we get i is now equal to two. It would keep going up like that, and that is called incrementing. Although less commonly, but occasionally used, we could also do decrementing, which is exactly the same thing, except switching this to a minus sign. And so here, well, what was i? i is currently equal to two. If we do i minus equals one, that's saying i is equal to whatever i was minus one. Since it was two, that's going to go down one, and now i is going to be one. We could do that again, and now i will be zero. All right, let's remind ourselves that grocery list is equal to the list of banana, orange, blueberries, fruit, and four. Let's use while loops in combination with decrementing to go backwards through the list. So we are going to do, well, we'll set j, usually use j instead of i as an index counter or inverse of counter kind of going down. We'll see it goes down instead of going up. Anything that involves indices, usually you use i or j and then maybe k if you need it. We could actually use i, but we're gonna use j. So we will do j is equal to the length of the grocery list minus one. Why are we doing that? Well, that is the last valid index. We know that the length of the list minus one, that is going to be the number that indexes the last element. So we'll set it equal to that and we'll do while, that's a keyword, while j is greater than or equal to zero colon and same like before, when we press enter here after a colon, it is going to indent this piece. Now we can grab the appropriate item with grocery list sub j because we set j equal to that final index there. So at first, grocery list sub j is gonna be four because the index is zero, one, two, three, four. j is four, 
grab that item, and so the item is also four, and then, well, next time in the loop, we actually need to tell it j minus equals one. And so what this does is whatever j was, well, we said it was four over here, then as we saw it decrementing, it'll make it three, and then it'll make it two. And it's looping, it's doing this over and over again, because while j is at least zero, at least is another way of saying greater than or equal to, while j is at least zero, continue to do this loop. Do this over and over and over again until this is not true. Because remember, this is a condition. This is going to evaluate to either true or false. If j is at least zero, this is gonna be true. If j is less than zero, this will be false. And this loop is only going to operate, it will only do this code over and over again while this thing is true. And so eventually it's gonna to get to the point where j, well, when j gets down to zero here, well, it says while j is at least zero, yeah, it'll do that one, it'll do when j is zero, and so we'll get bananas still, but then eventually when it's zero, we subtract one, j is gonna be minus one. And so when we check while j is at least zero, well, minus one is actually less than zero, so it will evaluate to false when the index basically goes to minus one, this slot over here, and it says, nope, I'm not gonna do this indented code anymore, I'm going to jump out here, and I will print end. I'll just make it do that to show it for sure. So what we should see is all of the grocery items, and then we print end. What went wrong? Well, we didn't print anything, so we should print the grocery list sub j, and then print end. There you go. Okay, so it prints every item in reverse, four and four, fruit and fruit, all the way down. It also does banana, which is the first one, and then it does end, which is over here. If we wanted to use a while loop instead of those four loops, but doing the same thing, which was just going through each of the items and printing them in order, well, we would need to do something similar, except use incrementing and start at zero. So if we did i, I'm choosing i, you could use j or any other variable name, i is equal to zero, and then we will do while i is less than the length of the grocery list. Since the valid indices, again, are zero up until and including four, zero, one, two, three, four, the length of the list is five, one, two, three, four, five things. And so this, this value is going to be five. We need to always make sure that i is less than the length because if it's ever equal to the length, well, that is actually referring to an index that is one past the end. That would be index five here, but we only have zero, one, two, three, and four, and so that would be out of bounds. We need this to always be less than the length of the list. So like before, we will put a colon there, press enter, and then we will print the grocery list sub i, and we need to i plus equals one. We increment i one each time, and if we run this, we will go through each of the elements printing them in order. I'd now like to go back to that if statement we saw earlier. So just to remind ourselves, if true, that means we will evaluate this indented code, print one will execute. If we instead had something that evaluated to false, then this will not execute. Well, we can actually elaborate on this if a little bit. We can do something called else if. Actually, that's what it is in some programming languages. It is actually elif in Python. It's just short for else if. We could do elif true and then print two. So what that does is it only prints two. This if was false, but then it says, hey, else if, well, this is true, so it printed two. But if this was also false, well, then it wouldn't print either of them. We could also have one more thing here called an else, which this else does no matter what. Like we're not gonna have some condition or Boolean here. We are just going to else, hey, if none of this stuff was done, we are going to do this, print three. And so if we run this, it says if false, well, I'm not gonna do that. Else if, no, that's also false, I won't do that. Else, well, since I didn't do any of the other stuff, I will actually print three. If instead any of these were true, say that the first one was true, well, it's going to print that one and it's going to do nothing else. It jumps at the end of everything. And so I'm going to bring back the print end just to show you it's done everything. So if true, it prints one, it jumps out and it does the end. Of course, if we had multiple things here, if we were printing, I'll just do the string of 1a, then it would also do that. So it does 1, then 1a, it jumps out, prints end, and it's all done. 
if this was true. Well, actually it's just going to do this one. It says this is true, it's gonna do these things, and then it jumps out either way. It's not because everything else was false, it simply finds the first thing that's true, and then it jumps out. So this is going to execute exactly the same thing. These down here do not matter. Even if we had, say, multiple else ifs, you could have many of them, elif say true again, we will print, I'll do, say, four here. Actually, I'm going to organize it a little better. This, I'm going to remove that. This will be one, this will be two, this will be three, and this will be four. So if we have this, if true, it's going to print one, ignore all of this stuff, and it is going to jump right to the end. If instead we had this was false, well, it's not gonna do that. I'll make this false as well. So it won't do this, it won't do that either. This one's true, so it's going to print three, and then it will jump to the end. And we can make that else get applied here. If we have all of these are false, and it says, hey, false, nope, won't do that. Nope, don't do that. Nope, don't do that. Okay, I will do the else. And so it will print four and then jump out to the end. Now, before we can make this code a little more practical, I wanna show you the operators and and or. We're gonna do or first. If we have true or true, then this evaluates to true. And if we had false or true, then this evaluates to true. And if we had, if I made this true, and then this false, then this is true. And this whole thing, this or is only false when it is false or false. Because what this or is looking for here, it is looking for either of the sides to be true. You can think about it, say, is this true or is this true? I'll be happy as long as one of them is true. If they're both false, well then I'll be false. If either side is true, so if this side is true, then I'll be happy it is true. And of course, if both of them are true, well then it's okay with that as well. Now we'll look at and. So and is only happy if both sides are true. We need this to be true and we need that to be true for the whole thing to be true. So true and true, well that's gonna be true. And every other combination here, this will be false. So if we had false and true, well, it's not happy with this side, and so it's false. If we instead flipped it, and the other side was false, it's still unhappy, this will all produce false because of this. And again, if we had both are false, well, it's not gonna be happy with that either. We need both sides to be true, and so false and false, that is also false. Taking this one step closer to practical, maybe we had say, and I'm gonna put it in brackets, we'll do three is greater than four, and, four is less than five. Okay, so this is going to evaluate two. Well, that's actually false. Three is actually less than four. And this side, four is less than five. Well, that's going to be true, except if this is false, well, then it's an and. This whole thing is going to be false. Let's now take this same piece, except switch the and to an or. So three greater than four, well, that produces false. Four less than five, that produces true. And so this is going to be in total, true. There is a true here, false or true is going to be true. Knowing what we know here, we can adjust our if statement chain to make it a little more practical. So say we had some variable here, age is equal to 15. Well, we could first print if maybe, if the age is less than one, well then we will print, we'll call them a newborn if the age is less than one. And we could maybe change this one. Well, if the age is less than we'll say five, well then we're going to call them just say young, for example. And if their age is less than, I don't know, maybe anything less than the age of age of uh, 20, well then we will call them 18. I know it's not quite perfect with everything, but you know, it's pretty close. It doesn't really matter. We're just having fun with this. And so otherwise we will just print, you know, adult. So basically what we did here is saying anything less than one, you're gonna be a newborn. If you're, well, bigger than one and less than five, then you're going to be young. If you're bigger than five and less than 20, we'll call you a teen. It's not really true, but whatever. And then otherwise, so that means if you're bigger than 20, then you're going to be an adult. So let's test this out. So right now, age is 15. And so if we were to run that, well, then we get teen because this was false and then this was false, but then this one was true. So we end up printing teen and then jumping out. If we had, say, the age of zero, well, then this one is gonna be true. We print newborn and jump out. If we print, say, age is equal to three, well, then that is gonna be young. It was this slot here. 
And if we instead may be made these equal to, so this adjusts it a little bit as well, right now, if the age is one, well, right now it's going to be called a young, okay? This one is not gonna be true because one is not less than one. This is the first one that gets executed. But if we change these to be, say, an equal to there, well, now we're letting equal to one as well be a newborn. So you have to be very careful about what we call those edge cases. They're on the edge. We'll now adjust this to actually properly make a teen. And for that, we are going to get rid of this young category here. And we'll make, you know, just three categories, newborn, adult, and teen. For this, well, a teen is not really anything, you know, just bigger than one and less than 20. There's like, you know, it starts at say 13. We'll call teens anything where you actually say the word teen. And so 13 to 19 inclusive. That means we would have to do if the age is, well, it's going to be bigger than or equal to 13. And so as well, the age is less than or equal to 19. That way, anything between 13 and 19 here, that will be called a teen. And so we use the and to get that done. If we had ages one, well, it's going to be a newborn. If we had age of two, well, that, uh, okay, that's now going to produce adult. That's not quite right. So we'll just say for this one here, not newborn and not teen. That's all we really know about this case. And so if age is two now, well, it's not a newborn and it's not a teen. If we had an age, say, equal to 13, well, that's a teen. If we had an age, say, 17, well, that's a teen. If we had an age, say, 19, well, that's a teen as well. And if we had anything outside that, say, age of 20, well, it's not a newborn and it's not a teen. I am now extremely excited to say that we are ready to talk about something called functions in Python, which is an extremely, like, very, very crucial topic. We have already seen functions in Python. We have not made our own function, but we have seen existing functions in Python. For example, print, P-R-I-N-T is a function called print. And what it does is takes a string. It takes say hi, for example, and it outputs that back to the output terminal. If we instead pass it something else, say hi to, well, it would take that and output it to the terminal. We will make our own print function in Python. Now it's gonna be a little bit dumbed down because technically print can take multiple inputs. We could pass it, say the string of hello three as well, and it would print that as well. We are going to just pretend that print only takes one thing, or we're at least going to make our own function that can only print a single string. So we make our own function by doing DEF, which is short for define. We're defining a function. We'll call it whatever we want. So define our print. You know, don't give it the name of an existing variable. Don't give it the name of, you know, exactly like print in Python. Those would all be silly. Same thing like if. Make it a function name that tells you what the function does and is something that is not already taken in Python. Define, in our case, our print. We do an open round bracket. And then because we are making a function that takes a single string and outputs that back to the output terminal, we are going to write s. I could have called this whatever I want. We're calling it s, which is short and sweet, to kind of tell you we are taking a singular string. We do colon and then press enter, just like the while and the for loops and the if statements, our code is going to be indented in this function. The function code will be indented because that's saying anything that's in this indent here, that means it belongs to that function. That means that when you call that function, like here we're calling the print function, when you go to call this function, that means anything that's in this kind of indent over here, that is going to be executed or be part of that function call. In this case, our function is going to be very, very simple. It is going to just do print s. And so whatever string that you pass it here, I use the word pass and we'll see why shortly. Whatever string that you pass it, we'll do our print and then pass say the string of hi two, just like above. By the way, clearly I didn't actually run that again. Hi two, our print, we will call hi two again as well and run that. Well, that does exactly the same thing because this hi two gets passed into this S and then we print S. And so it does the same thing as this print here. If we had multiple lines in this, we could do print, we'll just say S and then plus the string of say, hello. So all that does, you know, I'm not sure if I showed string concatenation before, but if we do S, which is a string plus another string, it'll just be that string plus that string at the end. 
So here we'll print that as well. And so it prints hi2 and then hi2 and then hello. First line executes that, second line executes that as well. Since we made this variable called s and then made it hi2, we should see that s down here is that variable as well. No, it's not. Name s is not defined. Okay, so what happened here? Why is s not defined? Even though very clearly we defined s here and then passed it hi2 into that s. Well, this is due to something called scope. So basically, when we have this parameter, I'm using the word parameter now instead of variable, a parameter is essentially a variable that is in the scope of a function. So here, when we put it in these brackets here, we're saying, hey, s is going to be a variable within this function. But outside of this function, s has absolutely no meaning. It does not even exist. So if you ask s outside here, outside the indentation, so even just out here, s has absolutely no meaning. It does not exist. It only exists within the function, and it takes on that value that you passed it when you called that function. So basically what you can picture happening is that we wanted to call the function our print, we wanted to do whatever our print does with passing this particular, what we call argument. We call this an argument because we're passing it over here and it receives over here as what we call a parameter. Okay, so we pass what we call arguments, we receive in the function what we call parameters. So those arguments turn into those parameters. So you can think of it as it taking this value, it getting shoved in here, we make a temporary variable called s and we do whatever we want with s where it's equal to that value and then after this function is done after we've hit the final line of that function you can think of s as just gone it does not exist anymore and so it only existed in the context of that function okay and i'll just run that again to fix it now you might be wondering well what the heck would happen if we did have a variable called s outside of the environment well if we do s right now s is going to break again we already saw that but what if we made s equal to say the number of 87 and then run that now what happens to our function because well s starts as 87 we do our print hi2 and then hi2 well does that go into the s there do we remove the old s well i'm just going to show you what happens so s currently is 87 outside of all of this if i run our function again what happens is that actually nothing changes at all. If you were to ask what s is outside of here, it is still gonna be equal to 87. And the function, it's still ran the same. In fact, I could keep running this, that is gonna keep outputting the same thing every time, and s out here is still gonna be 87. So as before, this s here, this is what we call actually local to this function. It means that it doesn't even care that if there was an outside s, it doesn't worry about that one. What happens here is that we make a new variable called s that's you know local to this function. s is going to take on this value in the context of this function. It does not care that there is an s outside of it. It is not worried about that at all. Now let's do another weird thing. So we were using s here and we had s both outside the environment and inside the environment. We saw what happened there. Well, what if we had another variable? We'll say set z equal to 42 over here and we'll run that so we know that outside z is equal to 42. Well what happens if we go to switch this s to a z? Does it find that z and it prints 42 or does it say that z does not exist? If I run it we do see that it finds that z. So what happens when Python is looking for these names to find these variable names? If you're looking for s well, first it's going to look, hey, is there an s associated with this function? Did I define s as a parameter in this function? If so, I'm going to use that value of s that you passed into me here. Okay, so it found that for s, and that's why we get hi2 there as that parameter s. But with z, it says, hey, is there a z associated with this function? No, I did not make a z as a parameter in this function. Is there a z outside that I can use? Yes, it did find a z outside we found that z equal to 42 outside. What if we tried to do a variable that did not exist? So maybe we tried to print maybe the variable just called tree like that. Well, if we run that, that says, hey, name error, name tree is not defined. It was first looking for a tree inside the function. Nope, didn't find that. It then looked in the outside and it said, nope, didn't find a tree there either. And then after that, it's like, well, I have no more places to look. I have to throw this error. I have to throw this name error because tree is not defined 
you asked for it, but I cannot find anything associated with that name. I'm just going to remove that and then call it again so we get no errors. All right, let's make a new function and we're going to call it this time, we will define times two, which is going to take a number, which we will make as a parameter x, and it is going to what we call return, that's a keyword, return x times two, okay? So we can call that just like above, times two with five. We'll pass it five, that five is going to go in as x, it will do whatever return is, we'll see shortly, return five times two, which will be 10. So it'll return 10, and what we'll see here is it outputs 10. Well, why did it output 10? Because we didn't have the word print in here anywhere. The reason it outputted 10 is for the same reason that if you would put 10 on say the last line here and run that, it spits out 10 back again. Well, that's because this actually gets replaced with that value of what we returned. We returned x times two, since we passed five in as x, it was five times two, so it returns 10. What that does is replaces this function call here with that value it returns. And so it replaced this with 10, and therefore it outputs 10 naturally. Our function above did not return anything at all. We didn't see return here, so what is it actually doing? Well, this gets replaced with something called none, actually. If you were to print what this thing is, so we will print the result of our print hi2. Well, what is that? That is something called none, okay? This is actually a thing in Python and it's not the string of none. It is actually what is referred to as none. Kind of like true or false, it has that capital there, it is none. And it outputs by default as nothing, but if you were to use the print method, if you were to actually print none, well then it does output back as none. Although none is maybe a little bit more complicated than this, you should usually just think of none as it represents nothing. And so by default, a function, if you don't write return, it is going to return nothing. Technically, it doesn't return literally nothing. It returns this thing none, which doesn't show up if you were just to output it naturally without print. So if we were to do our print like that, by default, it is not going to output anything, but technically it is none not nothing, but none is basically nothing. If that made very little sense, don't really worry about it. Just know that by default, a function is going to have this kind of implicit, implicit as in kind of hidden. It has this hidden return none here, where return leaves the function and return, what do we bring back? This is what we bring back. Here, we bring back none by default. So it really looks like this behind the scenes, and you know that it's not really gonna do any harm. You just didn't return anything as a part of the function. All right, going back to our other function. So we can see here it returns x times two, and what it doesn't do is something called a side effect, where a side effect is basically something that affects the function's outside environment. This function does not affect its outside environment. We simply pass a five into x, it returns 10, and it returns this into that value. Although technically you can think of that maybe ever so slightly as affecting the outside environment since it replaces this with the return, we don't really think of that as what's called a side effect. A side effect changes the outside environment. You know a good example of that is where we print something. This function, our print, has what we call a side effect because printing something affects the outside environment. We printed something outside, you know, it's outside of this function, we spit out something over here. That is a side effect. Although maybe technically printing is a side effect because it does technically affect its outside environment, we aren't really concerned with that too much. We are more concerned with side effects that affect the variables that are on the outside. So we will make a new function to demonstrate this and we will call it, we'll define append for to list. And you can probably guess what it does. It's going to take a parameter, we'll call it LST, short for list. And it is simply going to take that list and append for to that list. Now to demonstrate this in action, we'll make a list, we'll say A is equal to the list of one, two, and three. And then we will call append for to list and we'll pass it that list, which is A. So we'll pass A to that list and then we'll run that. Well, we get nothing outputted because again, this function here did not return anything. Technically it returned none, but by default, none is not really going to output anything here. So what did happen? Well, if we ask what A is, A is now the list of one, two, three, four. We appended four to that list.
This is a very serious side effect. We had a is one, two, three on the outside. After we called this function, a turned into a new variable. It changed to the list of one, two, three, four. It got modified, and that is a big side effect of this function. Neither of our two previous functions did something like that. If we looked at our previous one here, times two of x, well, let's try to emulate this as closely as we can. We'll make a variable called b, and we'll set that equal to four at first. And then we will do times two of b, so times two of b, we'll run that. So we know that b was first four, and then it outputted eight. Well, it outputted eight, because it returned four times two, which is eight. But if we added a code block in here, and we asked what is b, well, b is still four. B was completely unmodified. It started at four, even though we passed it to the function, we passed B in here, it went into that X value and it did return four times two is eight, but B itself did not change. This function did not have any side effect. If we look at our previous printing function, that did have a side effect because it did output this stuff to the terminal. That's technically affecting the outside, but if we were to try and copy like the same thing, we'll say R is equal to the string of hello at first, and then we will click R print with passing it R. So we do that, and then it's gonna output 42 like before, and hello plus hello, because the S gets the value of hello, it goes there, it prints that as well. But again, if we ask what R is, well, R is completely unmodified. We did not have a side effect on R there. And again, it might look like it did change because here it's opening with quotes, but here it's not. But that is just due to the nature of when you put this on the last line and output naturally, it shows the quotes. But here, when you use the print function, it doesn't show the quotes. It is the same value, R is unchanged. There was no side effect other than just printing in general. So it's really important to know if your function has a side effect or not, because that is what dictates whether something on the outside is actually affected. Here, A got affected, it's on the outside. We changed A on the other functions, we did not change our variables. It's really important to know that. Let's now make a new list called B. So we'll set B equal to A. So, well, A was one, two, three, four. So now B is going to be one, two, three, four as well. We saw the operator equals equals. So for example, one equals equals one. That is going to be true. They are the same number, but one equals equals two. That is false because they are not the same number. What about with lists? If we had the list of one equals equals the list of two, well, they aren't the same list. So this is gonna be false. But if this was also a one, then that would be true. And if we had one, two is equal equal to one, two, well, they are still the same list. This is gonna be true as well. Therefore, it should be true as well that A is equal equal to B because they are both the list of one, two, three, four, and so that is true as well. What if we instead replace the operator equals equals with the word is? This is a thing in Python, A is B, this is going to return true. Before I tell you what it means, I'm just gonna show you some examples. A is B is true, but if we had A is equal equal to the list of one, two, three, and four, well, that is still true. A is that list, but A is one, two, three, four is false. What the heck is this is thing doing? Well, we know that is is not just checking equality because A is equal to the list of one, two, three, four, but A is not the list of one, two, three, four. What is going on here? So basically when you create this list here in Python, the list of one, two, three, four, you can think of that as Python saying, okay, I need to have one, two, three, four stored somewhere in a list. So it remembers that. Earlier, when we had A, well, first we set A equals the list of one, two, three, and then we appended it to get that A was then equal to the list of one, two, three, four. Well, those are separate things. When it first got A, okay, A is one, two, three, it knows to remember that. Then we appended four to that. So now it's remembering, okay, A is the list of one, two, three, four. And then what it's doing over here is we're saying, oh, okay, one, two, three, four again. Well, they are not the same list of one, two, three, four. We have A, which is referring to the list of one, two, three, four. And then we have this other list here, the list of one, two, three, four as well. Those are different lists. They're the same value, except Python has to remember them both because they are not referring to the exact same set of things in what we call memory. 
So it remembers the list of one, two, three, four. It remembers A is that list of one, two, three, four. But this one here, it says, oh, okay, I'm gonna make another list of one, two, three, four. Those are different things. And so is checks, are they referring to the exact same thing? No, they are not. But why is it true that A is B is true? If this is true, and Python will not be wrong, A is B returns true because A and B are referring to that exact same list of one, two, three, four, okay? So what we did here, B equals A. So A was this one list of one, two, three, four. Python remembered that. And what we did when we set B equal to A, well, basically it said, well, A is referring to this specific list of one, two, three, four. If we set B equal to A, well, basically it says B, well, okay, you're also going to equal that exact same list of one, two, three, four. It didn't what we call copy it. What it could have done in an alternate, you know, version of Python, it could have copied it. It could have said, hey, A, you're equal to one, two, three, four. I'll set B equal to A. I will actually copy that and make a separate version of that. And so that they are distinct objects now, they're distinct things. And so A is B would be false, but that's not what Python does. Python says A is referring to this list of one, two, three, four, B equals A. Okay, A, if you were that list, B, I'm going to make you equal to that exact same thing. You'll have the same set of values because you are literally referring to that exact same piece of memory. So hopefully that made sense. If not, don't worry with examples and practice, you'll get used to the practical side of it and a little bit away from the theoretical side. It's really important to understand that though. And speaking of practicality, why do you care? Okay, I'm not just showing you this is operator to prove a point about trues and falses. This has a very important effect on the code that you write and you need to understand what's going on here because if we are referring to the same thing, if A is B, if they're referring to the same thing, that means that if you were to do a sub zero, okay, and I'm showing you a new operation as well, we do a sub zero equal to seven. What that does, as you can see, a, well, now that first thing changed to a seven, that zero spot, that changed to a seven. Since a and b are referring to the exact same things, that means that b as well. b is seven, two, three, four. Because a was the list of one, two, three, four, B was the same list of one, two, three, four. If you change A like this, we say, hey, that zeroth spot in A, we're gonna change that to a seven. Well, B is referring to that same set of stuff as well. So B will show that reflection because they are referring to the same things. A and B are referring to the same list. If you modify one, you will see the effect in the other. And so again, if you were to do something like that for B, if you did, b sub two, so the third number, let's change the third number equal to say a 12. Well, if you ask what b is, well, b is seven, two, 12, four. What is a? Well, they're referring to the same thing. So a is going to be that exact same thing. It saw the change as well. So what if you actually did want to make b a copy of a, meaning that you had a is originally the list of one, two, three, four, and then you said B equals A, but you wanted a copy. You didn't want B to refer to that same set of stuff because maybe you wanted to change A, but you didn't want to change B. Or maybe you wanted to change B and you didn't want to change A. You need what's called a copy, which says let's go in and whatever A actually was, A was the list of one, two, three, four. Let's try and get a copy. And so we'll make B a separate one, two, three, four. They'll both at first have the same set of values. They'll both be, you know, A is this one list of one, two, three, four. B is this other list of one, two, three, four. But if you make a copy, that means if you change A a bit, you won't see that change in B because they're referring to different things. If you change B a bit, you won't see the change in A because they're referring to different things. How do we get a copy? Well, in Python, and especially for lists in particular, there is different options to do this. But I'm gonna use the generic one that'll allow us to do this for pretty much anything we want to do. We will do from copy import deep copy. And then we will do B is equal to a deep copy of A, like that. So if we ask what A is, well, we did change it earlier. A is the list of seven, two, 12, 14. What is B? Well, first we made a copy of it, so they're gonna be the same thing. But if we do A sub zero, we'll change that first element to a 14. Of course, if we ask what A is, it'll have that reflection. But in B, if we output that, that change is not shown. 
it did not get touched because now A and B are copies, or they were copies of each other. We changed A, but that change did not reflect B because we made them refer to different things. Let's show this for numbers now. So what if you instead did Q is equal to five? Well, Q is going to output as five. What if you set W equal to Q? Well, W is going to take on the same value. It's five, but what if we changed Q? Q is equal to seven, and so Q should output as seven. Okay, well, what happens now to W? Because like before, we had some variable equals something, and then another variable equals that variable, and then we change now that first variable. So like this, well, like it did with the list, we saw that the change would be reflected in W, and that since we changed Q, we should see a change in W, but we don't. W stayed with what it originally was, which is five. Right now, this might look like numbers and lists are just behaving completely differently here, except it is not the case. There is definitely differences between them, but this is really not the case here. If you look very closely at the syntax here, what we did here with the numbers was only ever equals signs. Again, we started off with Q equals some number, and then we set W equal to Q. They are both referring to that five, and if we change Q equal to seven, well, what is that actually doing, okay? Here is where I was trying to say we're modifying this. We're modifying Q, except here we're setting Q equal to seven. That's not saying, hey, that seven over there, we're gonna change that. No, 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 that's saying like before, if we have something new over here, we're setting Q or changing our mind about it and setting Q equal to the seven. We're saying, oh, okay, there's seven here. I'm gonna make Q remember that. And remember at the very beginning, we were saying we could change variables to whatever we wanted to. We could make them whatever we want. We changed our mind about Q and we said, hey, no, remember that it's seven over here. And so W is still five. We never changed that fact. And this is very, very different than what we did with the lists. Because what we did with the lists was that, hey, set A and B equal to the same thing at first. And this was our modification. We said, hey, that first spot of A, whatever that's referring to, we're gonna change that to a seven. And so that change was reflected in A and B because they were both referring to that same list and we didn't change our mind about anything. We never said, hey, A, I'm gonna make you equal to something else. We're just saying here with this syntax, the first spot of A, that first piece of the list it's referring to, we are going to change that. And so that change is reflected in both A and B, whereas with the number case down here, we just changed our mind about Q. We said, no, no, no. You're gonna to refer to this seven over here and this W, it's gonna keep referring to that five. We didn't touch it at all. This holds completely true in functions as well. All of these examples were outside of functions. What if we tried to do something very similar, but in a function? We'll make a new function. I'll say define add one. And what this function is going to do is take a variable, we will call it X, and it is going to say take X and it is going to add one to that. It'll do X plus one. And actually let's return that. We will return x plus one for now. And so if we gave add one with four, well, we know that's going to return it here and it is going to be four plus one, which is five. Well, what if we now change this just a little bit and we said, hey, no, x, I'm actually going to set you equal to eight in here. And so what that effectively does is, well, it says four, I'm gonna pass you into x here. And so x is four within this function. But now it says, hey, I'm gonna completely change my mind. Whatever it was before, I'm just going to make X refer to eight. And so it returns eight plus one, which is going to be nine. Again, we can even change our mind about the data type. What if, for example, we pass the number as four into X here, and then we actually said, hey, no, X is going to be the list of one, two. And then we did say, return the list of, or return just X. Well, that is going to completely replace this with one, two. We passed four here into X. We changed our mind, said, nope, I don't care that X was four. I'm gonna make you the list of one, two. We will return that back and we get the list of one, two. So that stayed consistent with above. We could change our mind about a variable. And we said, hey, no, whatever you were before, I don't care. I'm gonna make you this. And then that's not gonna change whatever you sent in. Say for example, we did A is equal to the list of one, two. We'll do three so that it's different. And then if we do add one of A, well, that is not going to affect A. If we run all of this, 
and check what a is, well, a is still going to be the list of 1, 2, 3. This function doesn't have a side effect because what it does here, it receives a into this list here. So it says x is going to be whatever we passed here. We passed the list of 1, 2, 3 x is the list of 1, 2, 3, but then we changed our mind. We said, I don't care that it was the list of 1, 2, 3. I am going to just make it the list of 1, 2, return x. And so that makes this the list of 1, 2. We don't see it, but we don't change a. This has no side effect. The big question here is what if we were to do before that stuff, print x is a. Okay, so what am I doing here? Well, this makes a temporary variable that is equal to whatever we sent it in. We sent in a as 1, 2, 3, and so we can think of x as 1, 2, 3. But is x a copy of a? As in, since we sent in a, which is 1, 2, 3, are we saying that x is going to be referring to the same thing as a? Or are we going to refer to a different 1, 2, 3? Are we going to take that 1, 2, 3, copy it, and then they'll refer to different things, meaning that changes in one will not reflect change in the other? This is going to output true x is a. Up here, x and a are referring to exactly the same thing. But as soon as we change our mind about x, just like earlier way above, we found that if you change your mind about this variable here, that means that, you know, a was referring to this list of 1, 2, 3. We said, hey, x, no, I'm actually going to change my mind about you. I will set you equal to this list of 1, 2. So down here, if we print x is a, it better return as we see false. As soon as we change our mind about x, they are no longer referring to the same thing. This means that if at this level we were to do some change to x, so let's do x.append with a 4. While we run that, we do see a change reflected in a. a was originally the list of 1, 2, 3. We passed it in as add 1 here. It became this x, and they are referring, x and a are referring to the exact same list of 1, 2, 3. If we do an append on x, that means that we are appending to a as well, because they're referring to the same thing. So at the end, we do see that a did get affected. We did get a 4 on there, but if we were to do it down here, if we instead removed this, we'll remove this, and then run here, x dot append with 4 at this level. Well, we set a to 1, 2, 3, that goes in here, and then we immediately change our mind well, we're not going to see that change get reflected in that case. If that did not make sense at all, please watch it all again and experiment on your own with using the word is, playing around with variables and passing them to functions to make sure that you understand that stuff. It is really, really important. If you do need to search more on the topic, the words pass by value, pass by reference, uh, maybe scope in Python will get you that answer. It's a complicated thing though, and I tried my best to show you the important pieces of it without going too much into the details and the terminology. All right, let's look a little more into functions now. So I think we've only seen functions with one variable. We can easily have multiple. We will define, we'll just say add, and that is going to be, well, we're gonna implement addition as a function. So we will take two numbers, a and b, and we will simply do a return of a plus b. So that if you had maybe add of five and nine, well, that is going to return 14. Pretty easy. If you wanted to have multiple variables, you know, even more than two, you could do a, b, and c, and we'll do a plus b plus c. Now, what happens if we try to run just this? Well, that's gonna throw an error. It says add missing one required positional argument, c. So we had five and nine, five goes into a, nine goes into b, but we said that C was required here, but we didn't have anything for C. We can fix that easily. We'll just put, say, a 2 there, and then we're going to get 16. Something pretty cool we can do in Python and in some other languages is we could maybe make this not required. And so right now it was throwing an error. If we had just left that out, that goes back to throwing the same error. But we can actually make this not an error, but still have C as a parameter here by doing an equal sign and saying setting it to 4. What this does is saying basically a default. So we're saying you can tell us what C is. If you want to say override C and make it a value other than four, you can go ahead and do that. Otherwise by default, I'm gonna make it four. So that right now, this is going to be five plus nine is 14. And then plus the default of four, it is going to be 18. 
we can do multiple of these if we wanted. So we could maybe make it a variable d is equal to say two, and I'm gonna make the math a little bit easier. I'll make a one and b equal to two. So we should see one and two is three, plus four is seven, plus two, well, we have to add that, plus two is going to give us nine in total. The finicky part about this is you must have all of these required parameters listed before all of the optional parameters. So for example, if you tried to do, I'll just go back to A and B. If we tried to do A equals two and then B, I will remove C and D entirely and in the return. So what do we have here? A equals two and then B. So how would I try to call this? Well, we'll say that A is already having a default. And so maybe we could give it a two there and maybe that would go to B. But no, it says non-default argument follows default argument. You must have the required before the optional. So we'll just go back to A and B. If we had A and we will make B a default now, so B by default is four, you can also override it if you want to. So here, add two is going to give six because A is two and that by default B takes four. But if you wanted to override that, we could easily give say five there then five goes into B and it ignores that default value of four and it is going to give two plus five is seven. Okay, so they're truly called optional or defaults because you can override them if you want to. And the only way that Python really understands how to do this no matter what is if you list all of the required stuff before all of the optional. If we add another with a default, we'll say C equals five and we will do plus C. Well, right now this is fine. We're gonna give two to A we will give B five because we're following it in order. Two goes to A, then five goes to B, and it's still fine with this because the five is going to override B and make that five, but then C is going to keep its default argument. So we should see two plus five plus five, which is equal to 12. What's really cool about Python is you can use equal signs in the call as well. So for example, if we removed everything for now and said A equals four, well, it's going to be okay with this. And I'll run that because it says, well, we need A, we haven't have a default for A, so we'll set that and set A equal to four. And then B is a default of four and C is a default of five. So four goes into A and then B has four, C has five, so we return 13. And what's really cool is the order, you know, when you're doing the equals signs, you don't really care about the order because you're already specifying what these things are. Here is clearly telling Python that you want A to B4. And even though up here, it's the order of A, B, C, I could do B equals 10 and then say C equals four. And note that the order down here is pretty messed up, but we're clearly saying to Python, no, I want B to be 10, I want C to be four and A to be four. So that's what it does. It says A is gonna be four. It says B is gonna be overrided. By default, it was four, but I'm setting B equal to 10 and C equal to four, I'm gonna override that default to five and set it equal to four. So our result is going to be four plus 10 plus four, which is 18. Now this function is just doing addition. So I wanna do something where order actually really matters. We will do something slightly more complicated to show you this is still right. We will do A times B. Whenever something is a little bit uncertain, make sure you just put brackets around it. That would probably be fine as is, but A times B and then plus C. Well, what is that going to return? Well, it's 44, let's check that. Four times 10 is 40, plus C is 44. So it's getting the correct arguments. Now note that only if you do all equal signs down here is there really no order involved at all. The second that you try to do anything without an equal sign, that is going to imply order. So what do we have here? A 10, C equals four and A equals four. Well, this is kind of hard to parse because we have 10, well, that's gonna put it in A and then B is four by default, and then we're setting A equal to four again. So guess what? This is actually an error. Got multiple values for A, and that's because, yeah, that 10 is gonna go into A, but then we're specifying that A is gonna be four, so it does A again. This would only work if we set B by this, and so now it's fine because 10 goes into A, and then we clearly set B and C equal to four each, and so we get 44 again. Now, admittedly, this is a little bit of a confusing topic. So what I do so that I don't get confused by this, generally I do one or the other. I do either all setting them in order, like say 10, three, and then leave that as is should be fine because 10 goes into A, three goes into B, and then C will keep its default. 
So we're going to get 10 times 3 is 30, plus C is 5 is 35. And if you don't want to do the in order way, if you do want to do the equal signs way, well then probably just do all of them as the equal signs way. So if you only wanted to set A, we'll then set A equal to 5, and then we'll just leave their default. Or maybe if you did want to set, say, C, well then we'll do C is equal to 2. You know, do one or the other. You could definitely mix them up. But personally, I very rarely do like one thing as using the ordered method and then another as the equals method. Okay, now we're going to cover file input and output in Python. So this means reading from files and writing to files. So Google Colab does have this file set up for us. We can go over here and first we're going to read from a file, which assumes there is already some file on our system here that we want to read from. I am first going to make that file since we don't really have one that I want to read from here. So this is not the Python part. This is just setting this up. New file, I'm going to make one called a underscore test dot txt so a text file and by default that file is empty if i double click we'll have this editor over here i'm going to put on the first line hello there on the second one maybe some numbers 42 and then i'll do 35 76 and then this comma is comma the end okay i will uh, control s to save that and then exit it and then we should have that file which has the content in there now we're going to use Python to read from that. Before we can worry about Python, we have to understand the path of our file system here. So we can check what we have access to with exclamation ls, which means list stuff basically. It's a Linux command. And so we can see a test.txt and sample data. Perfect, we don't have to worry about sample data. We have access to a test.txt, which is the file we want. So the path is literally just as we'll pass it as a string, it is going to be a test.txt. Okay, so I'm going to make that a variable. The string of that p for path is equal to that. Now that we have access to that, we can use Python to open that. The best way to read a file in Python is to write with and then open the path to that file which we stored in p. And then since we're reading, we're going to put an r here in strings. So we with open that as f. And then we're going to have that same colon indented combo. So we're only going to talk to F or the file in this indented code here. Don't talk to it outside of the indent. So we can just do for now print. We'll do F dot read lines. So that kind of does what it says. It reads the lines. Since F is the variable referring to the file, we read all of its lines. And we are going to see the output of that is this list here, a bunch of strings. So read lines wasn't the only option, but what this one does is read all of the lines at once and it stores them in a list of strings. So we see the first string is hello there and then backslash n. We have the backslash n because that is actually what is behind the scenes in the computer saying this is, I press the enter key. Okay, when you actually look at the file in like an editor, it doesn't really show you that most of the time. There's actually a way to see that, but usually we just see that it has like line numbers but, but to the computer, it is actually hello there, backslash n42, backslash n35, backslash n. There's not really a concept of these different lines here. It's just that they have this new line character, which we know refers to a new line. One alternative to f.read lines is just f.read. So print f.read is going to show you it exactly like you'd probably expect. That is literally just the file like we saw in the editor that'll output it the same way. So what's the difference? Well, it's not that we're storing it in a list. This is actually just returning the complete raw string of the text. And since print knows to understand that if it sees backslash ends in the string, well, that's actually going to interpret that as a new line and that will print it prettily to us as the new lines shown. Both of those techniques actually read in the file all at once. Sometimes you might want to read a file one line at a time and we can use a for loop for that. So we will do for line in f and then if you print the line well that's automatically going to make line one line of the file at a time and so we get each line if you did want to fix that problem you could just remove the extra new line character that's on the line each time and that's on the right side so we do line dot r strip and then bracket bracket and that is going to remove that new line character on the right and you can see here it is going to output just like the other one one reason you might want to do this method, the line by line method, instead of reading the file all at once, 
is because think if you have like a really, really big file. Well, you could go line by line, no problem, because you could say first line, next line, and you know, it would still take a long time to get to the very end of the file. But if you tried to read all at once this massive file, well, it's going to take a really long time to get any result, and you might crash and never get any results. So often the line by line method can be a better way to go, and it's just easier to keep track of things sometimes. Now we are going to write to a file in Python. So we will make a new file and we will put some contents in it. So we do that very similar to before with with open path to that file. Well, the path to that file is not going to exist, but we can make a new one. So we'll say new file.txt. So that means in this folder, we're going to create a file called new file.txt. We're going to open this in W or write mode because we're writing. And we're going to do as f before it's still a file so we're still going to call it f and then we will just do f dot write for now we will put hello and that is it okay we're going to run that and we see no errors it's totally happy with that if we check our files we see this file called new file txt we will double click to look at that and we see one line with hello now without touching anything other than the string in here I'm just going to change this to high to show you what happens. We run that and we will see again, no errors. It's okay with that. Even though this file already existed, it's okay. But what it does is it removes that earlier hello. Okay, what it's doing is not actually removing it. It's just killing that file and starting a new one. It's saying whatever was there before, no, no, I'm gonna to write to this file and I'm gonna make a new one and I'm going to give whatever contents you told me here, you said just write high. So I'm going to write high. This is the fundamental difference between write and appending to a file. If we instead just make the tiniest change here from this from a W to an A, and we will change this up, say just hello to have something different here. We run that. Well, guess what happens to our file? We do have to kind of reload it here. New file.txt has hi and hello. Even though we didn't actually write hi over here, there's still hi hello. That is because we appended to a file here. A is for append, and that means don't worry about what was there before. Keep what was there before, don't touch it, and then just write whatever you want to. So we're appending to that file. We had hi earlier, we opened that file and wrote hello to it, so we now have hi hello. Do notice that we're not getting any new lines here. What we probably wanted was hi on one line and then hello on the next. So what we'll do to fix that is simply just add a backslash n here. So now since we are appending, we should see that we have hi hello. And then since we're doing hello backslash n, well actually that's not really gonna fix our problem. In this case, we need to put it in front here. And so then we have hi hello a new line character and then hello. So if we run that and we refresh our file over here, we should see that we have hi hello on the first line and then hello on the next. There's definitely more you could look into for writing and reading from files, but to be honest, those three are really all you need to know. To read from a file, you can do an R like this, and then you can go line by line or read all at once. And then for writing or appending, well, if you want to completely remove what was there before, you would change this to a W, and so it kills that file and then writes whatever you want. Or if you wanted to keep the contents of that file and then just append to it, well, then we would use A. So those are the three things read, write, and append. There are some other commands that you'll see if you look it up, but you'll be pretty fine with just those. I'm very happy to say we're gonna talk about objects and classes in Python. This is kind of where all of those confusing weird pieces are gonna kind of put together in your head, okay? It doesn't necessarily involve everything, like we're not gonna talk about files here, but all of the different things were like, why is this a dot this? Except why is this just an open this and there's no dot there? and this is just a variable here. So a class in Python is essentially a factory. It is not like a thing itself, like me, Greg, that's a, probably a thing, you know, a turtle, a light fixture. It's not something like that. It is a factory. It is something that builds those type of things and we can choose what type of thing you want to build. So for example, what if I wanted to build a class or a factory that was say a human? So how do we construct a human? Well, of course, biologically, you probably need a lot of different things and we don't even fully understand that yet. But I can really simplify this and say, okay, well, to have a human, I need to know their age and their name. You know, you don't necessarily need all of the details here. I'm not trying to talk about biology. Say in a database, we needed to store information about people. What do we need to store about the people? 
Well, I'll just store their name and their age, okay? So don't get bogged down in the details here. There's some really weird wordings that I'm gonna discuss at the end, but we'll define a function in here called underscore underscore init underscore underscore. You can think of this as initialize or create basically. So initialize, we put this word self here, which I'll explain fully very shortly, self, and then in no particular order, age, and then name. Okay, so those are the things that we're keeping track of. We need their age and their name. Or since we're making a function, another colon here, and I am just going to set self dot underscore age equal to the age and self dot underscore name equal to the name. That is the end of our factory for now. I'm just gonna leave that as is. So what we just made is a factory that can make a human, but we didn't actually make a human. Let's make a human. And so we'll use our factory to do that. We'll make a human and we're gonna call it H. It's just short for human. H is equal to human like that and then bracket. And then we will give the things that we require. We'll set age equal to four and we'll set name equal to, I'll make him Greg. This is a very young Greg with just the variable name as H controlling me. I'm okay with that. So we have that human in H and if I output H, well, we see something kind of weird, but at least we didn't see an error. Now, before I fill in all of the missing details here, I do at least want this to be properly printed because this is not telling us very useful information. To do this, I'm gonna make a new function in this class and it's gonna be defining underscore underscore str for string. We're trying to get an appropriate string representation for a member of this class. So we'll do self, that's all we need here and we'll return some sort of a string that we want to show. For now, I'm just gonna return hi to kind of show you how this works, completely ignoring self and any information of this. If we do this now, well, it's going to return actually nothing different. Technically, this string is not gonna help us for this. We actually need to do print now. So we'll do print h, and then we will get the string method of hi. If you did want to not use the printing function here, you could also add in this thing called repr. It's very, very, very similar, except the difference is really for Google Colab's point of view, it is calling repr when you just do the h thing by itself. And if you call it with print, well, print is going to talk to the string method. So we'll just have them under both so that either way we print, it's gonna show the same thing. But most of the time in practice, if you're not using something like Google Colab, you probably will do the string method more commonly than the repr one. Now, I guess from here on out, I'm going to go one level zoom past. I like to be as zoomed in as possible, but I guess we have to show everything there. And now I want to fix these string and repr methods. Either one, they're not showing anything useful still. Okay, so let's fix them up. Instead of just saying hi, let's actually make them output something interesting about the human. Well, what do we know about them? We know their name and their age, and we actually have that stored in self underscore name and self underscore age, because we know how functions work as before. This is really just calling the init function here. It's calling this function, except ignore the self. Don't worry about that for now. Pretend that doesn't exist. If we have age equal to four, well, that's putting the age of four there, and the name is Greg. So we should have age is four there and name is Greg. And then what this is saying over here is saying, hey, in self thing, in the self, store in itself dot underscore age, the age that we gave, and store in self dot underscore name, the name that we gave. So we have access to their name and their age through this self object here. So we can do return a human with name, and then I'll put a space there so we can do plus, the self dot underscore name, because that's whatever name they had. And actually, I'm going to just leave that as is. I'm going to put a period to finish off the sentence. I will copy that and have it so it's both stir or string and repr. And if we run that, we should see a human with name Greg. We'll now get their age to show up there as well. So we'll put it there and do plus their age is space and then plus their age that is stored in self dot underscore age. And then we will finish off the sentence with just a period and that should look nice and pretty. If we copy that for both the string and the repr method, we run that actually we're about to see an error which has absolutely nothing to do with classes. 
this is a string concatenation error, can only concatenate string, not int to string. So the problem here is that this piece right here, we are trying to concatenate you know, a string with what is actually an integer. Remember, this is just the integer of four. And so to fix this, it's really easy. You can just convert an integer to a string like that, string of self dot underscore age. That should work. We'll do that for that one as well, the exact same way. And now we should see both their name and their age, a human with name Greg and their age is four. All right, so let's explain all of the details here. So we make a class called human. It's basically a factory that makes humans. And down here, we made one human. We made it and we stored it in a variable called h. That variable doesn't really matter. That's just how you reference this thing. It is a human, which we create like this. And we gave it the age of four and the name of Greg. Okay, so this is one particular human that was made out of this class, human factory. So when we make a human, we call it like this. And that actually runs this method here and makes a human. Now, this is not an error. I know it might seem that way where we have ages four, it goes in there, name is Greg, and then self has nothing for it. Well, it's just an implicit kind of weird thing in Python. This is how they chose to do it. And so you put self here, which is referring to this particular human that you're talking about. Okay, when I'm making a human, a new human here, I have an age associated with that and a name associated with that. I have the age there, the name there, and in this particular human, which is self, I'm saying, hey, self dot underscore age, I'm setting your age equal to the age that you gave us. And I'm setting the name equal to that name that you gave us. And over here, we have access to that self. So if you wanna ask, hey, what's the string representation of this human, of this self here, we return a human with name, say the self, so that particular human's name, we stored that and their age is there. Well, their particular age that you stored in self. Self is that particular human that you created. At the beginning of this, I said we'd talk about classes and objects. Well, I haven't really said the word object. An object is an instance of a class, okay? So a factory or a class produces something, okay? It has the ability to produce something. When it does produce something, here it made a human, we say that this human is an object or this H is an object, it is an instance, you know, it is one actual kind of physical representation of what this thing produces. It is an object or an instance of a class and it is of class human. You might also say it's an object of class human. Sticking with the object oriented programming kind of general lingo, you would probably call this init function as the constructor of this class. It is how you construct or the function that constructs a human. This class human currently has what we call attributes, which are basically, you know, parts of this human which don't really do anything. Okay, this age here, it's a number. It helps identify it and it's useful to keep track of, but it doesn't really do anything. And by do something, I mean a function. It's not a function. This age is a number and this name is a string, but we don't have any functions or things that this human can do, which we call methods. Technically speaking, this class actually does have three methods. It has init, string, and wrapper, which are all, since we see the def and you know the brackets here, they are functions associated with this class, and therefore they are methods, because that's what a method is. But we haven't really created our own method that does something interesting with a human. We've only been able to construct it and just print it with these kind of underscore things, which are not something I want to get into, but it's just a built-in thing in Python. We want to make our own methods that are gonna do something interesting with a human. Just before we do that, I need to show you that through H here, we can actually access this human's attributes. We can access its age and its name through H dot underscore age and H dot underscore name. So H dot underscore age, we are going to output four because that's their age. And H dot underscore name, we can see that that is Greg. And to really prove that these things are actually methods that we can access as well, if you really wanted to, you would never do this, but if you really wanted to, you could do h dot underscore underscore str underscore underscore and then bracket bracket because that is a function. It is associated with this human. So we do h call its string method like that and we run that and that does what it says it does. It outputs a human with name Greg, their age is four. 
So all that print does is just it calls this thing and then it outputs the terminal. Knowing this, we are now able to make a method and I'm going to make it define, we're going to call it without any underscores here, we're going to define older, younger, then. And it's going to take self because pretty much all of these are gonna take self. If you need access to the object, which you most likely do, you're gonna have self there and then we'll take another age, okay? This is a totally separate age and it is going to compare the own age, so ourselves age, to that age. So we'll make a simple if statement. If self dot underscore age is bigger than age, so if our age is bigger than that other age, then we will print that, well, just that, our age is bigger than their age, period. And we will do maybe an if else, or sorry, an elif here, else if, or elif, self dot underscore age is equal equal to the age. Well, then we will print that our age is equal to their age, period. And then finally, the else, well, that must mean that theirs is bigger than ours. So we will do print that our age is less than their age, period. We run that and we now have access to this older younger than method. So we'll go ahead and use that down here. We will do h dot older younger then give it another age. We'll give it three for now. And that is going to output our age is bigger than their age. Since our age is four here, it is bigger than their age, which is three. If we instead had four, that would show that they're equal to each other. And if we had say five, that would show that our age is less than their age. That is one interesting method that we can use on humans. Now there's definitely more you could talk about here, like object-oriented programming further into that, software engineering principles surrounding that, the term design principles is closely related here, as well as the specifics in Python are a little bit weird, like why do we have two underscores here, and why do we have one underscore here, and why do we have no underscores here? Well, partly it's because sometimes we had to, partly it's because sometimes I chose to. Don't really worry about it right now though. If you really do care, maybe look up the difference between private and public and what that means in Python. On. There's actually technically no concept of private and public, but because it's similar in Java and C++ and other languages, that will probably get you a close enough search. Uh, and, you know, I think this is probably fine as it is, but maybe look up some of those terms if you do right now really want to explore that more. Okay, I'm very happy to say that we're done with all of that really confusing stuff. There's probably not going to be another piece in here that is nearly as hard as anything we've seen. Okay, so awesome job if you got this far. Now what I'd like to do is cover in order a bunch of different things that some people might have even taught at the very beginning. So to start this off, I'm gonna talk about comments, which are basically just any code that is not actually meant to be read by Python, but meant to be read by usually English, but not always usually English programmers. So we're just trying to give some information about something. So we put a hashtag which says, hey Python, do not run this. This is just meant to be read by a human. So we could say, the following, the following is a function that multiplies two numbers. Okay, so I'm gonna write a function. We'll call it mult, define mult, which takes A and B, and we are simply going to return A times B. Okay, so I'm just telling someone, hey, that's what this function does. There is a very useful function in Python called help, where if we do help and then say print, we're asking help on print. Give us information about this. So it says, there, here's help on the built-in function print in module built-ins, okay? So it says built-in because, you know, it's not you or I or someone else that created this. It's the makers of Python that had this built-in. So it's a built-in function that's in the module built-ins. We'll talk about modules in a bit. Print dot dot dot. Print takes a value, okay? So a value, what is that? Well, it prints the value to a stream or to system standard output by default. And there's optional keyword arguments like sep, end, file, and flush. And it says what each of those are. It says file is a file-like object, defaults to the current system standard output. Sep, string inserted between values, default a space. End, string appended after the last value, default a new line flush, whether to forcibly flush the stream. Okay, so it gives us a bunch of information on, you know, what these parameters are, what their default values are, what you need to pass us here, you print the values to a stream, 
and there's actually dot 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 because you can kind of do an infinite number of things and yeah so you get a bunch of information on it what i would like to do now is be able to call help and i should run this i should be able to call help on malt except right now i'll show you this doesn't really give anything interesting it just says malt ab so we can return some helpful information if we go in here and write a doc string. Okay, so a doc string is this uh, triple single quote thing, single quote, single quote, single quote, and then you'll see that it goes this red color. I'm gonna put a new line here, and then just write a description of it for now. So I'll say mult of A and B is a function which returns the multiplication of A and B. Okay, and now we're going to specify that A must be a number and B must be a number as well. Okay, there's not actually technically what's called a number data type in Python, but this is enough to clearly tell the user, hey, A and B should be a number. It could be an integer, you know, they could be a floating point number. Make sure that they're a number and this will be okay. So we will close that with our triple single quote. That means that all of this is pretty much the same as you know right here it's still a comment except it's what's called a doc string which makes it show up in help so that we can see if we call help on mult again well now all of that is just going to show up so this is incredibly useful and in fact it actually speaks to something a lot bigger than just writing a doc string it's the first time we've actually seen anywhere where we've told the user that you have to do specific things like here technically if you wanted to with this mult function here we could do mult of say this string we'll do friend you and i are friends apparently and then we will do one two three as a list we can run that but we get an error and I don't care what the error is. The point is we should probably expect an error or something weird because if you were to ask help on this function, it will very clearly say that, hey, no, A better be a number and B better be a number. Technically in Python, there is no stopping you from doing this, but we are telling you, hey, if you want to use my function here, if you want to use mult, you better follow the rules and the rules say that A better be a number and B better be a number as well. If we have wrote a good function in this mult here, well, that means that any combination of A and B should at least return something that makes sense. Okay, so we could write a four here and then maybe a negative 3.2. That will return, well, negative 12.8. Since A was a number and B was a number, you know, we got a result that made sense. You can actually ask help on more than just functions here. We could put it into our class, which is very, very common. So we have this big thing now, like it's so much code here tied to this class. Well, let's give some information about it. We'll put a doc string, so that triple single quote thing. I'll just put all of it there for now. And we will say, this is a class that represents a very simplified uh, human, okay? So we uh, it takes their age, so we'll say, it takes their age as an integer and their name as a string. So I'm gonna put, I'll actually call that str. This is going to be int, that really shouldn't be capitalized technically. So their age is an int, and their name is a string, and, uh, and they have some functions, okay? You could put whatever there you want. I'm not gonna teach a master class in all of the Python conventions here. Most of the time you follow what the organization follows. Maybe if you're writing to uh, what we'll see later, like NumPy or you know a machine learning library or any library at all, um, you know they'll have specific standards on how to write these things. For now, I'm just showing you that you can. And so if we were to run this again and we asked help on this human, so help on human the class okay so this is human the class itself that exact name right there well that is going to return that so all of that here they actually have their own kind of uh writing as well it doesn't just do what we did uh, but it does put that there so it says class human human age name and here's this piece we wrote this is a class that represents a simplified human takes their age as an int and their name as a string and then they wrote this for us methods defined here all these different methods and data descriptors uh, don't really worry about that okay so uh, it's even better for classes they have some awesome built-in stuff there and you can do it not just for you know the class itself but here h okay so remember h's age was four we could ask help on h itself sorry h itself and that is actually going to return uh, the exact same thing it's not going to be the specifics to that human it's really just the same way as doing help on the class itself and even if you just had something like a number so we will do 
say a is equal to four. And if we asked help on a, well, that will tell us actually a lot of information. You'd be surprised at how complicated numbers are in Python. Int, which is an integer, you know, all of this different stuff. I'm definitely not gonna read this for you, but you can ask help on just about anything. Note that if we did help on a, what we call a literal, so a literal is like, literally you just write the number in there, help on six is actually going to work as well. Like that's really cool. So that's a, uh, yeah, that's really help. I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I'm not gonna talk about comments anymore. If you wanna write just a one line comment, you can do it like that. If you want to show it up as a doc string, which shows up in help, then you can put it in there, either like for a function or a class or probably other options as well. Okay, we are now going to one by one look into each of the complex data types in Python. And what we mean by complex, I don't necessarily mean difficult, um, although it's probably more confusing than just a number. Uh, complex, we really mean uh, they can do multiple things, okay? And what you'll really find is they're just the same as those classes or objects that we already looked at. They have different things that you could do. For example, we had a list. So I'll make a list called L and we'll just make it the list of one, two, three, and we could do L dot append, okay? So hopefully this makes sense now. Append is a method that's on this list object where the list has a class of, you know, a list, okay? So this list object, one, two, three, it has this append, which is a method, uh, and this method has a side effect, okay? So that side effect is to adjust this, uh, this object here. So we can do append four, and then we can see that L uh, is now the list of one, two, three, four. So we're gonna look at almost all of the complexities of lists. There's a lot that you could do with them, and I don't expect you to memorize this section. Just kind of try to remember that there's some useful things that you can do with each of these data types. So starting with a list, we can, well, we saw append, we can also do insert. So if you do L dot insert, and then you give a placement. So we will do, see the index of zero, that means at the very beginning, and then some item. And actually you can put whatever you want in lists. So I will put, say, hi in there. So now what that does is inserts into the zeroth spot or that first spot, hi. So that L is now hi, one, two, three, four. You could count the number of items in this list. So let's just make this a little more complicated. If we do L dot append, and then we will append say four as well. So now we have that L is high, one, two, three, four, four. Well, we could do L dot count and then four. So what that does is two, because four occurred twice. If we were to count high, well, high right there, we get one occurrence of that. And if something's outside of it or not in it at all, let's count the occurrences of seven. Well, that should be zero, there's no sevens. You could do L dot reverse. So L dot reverse. You might be able to guess what that does. That simply reverses the list and that actually does it. So note here, this has a side effect, but it's not returning anything. If you ask what L is, well, it actually fundamentally reversed that list. So remember that like anything, you have to know beforehand whether something has a side effect or not. It turns out that this does, it doesn't just return. We, there's an option, like they could have chose to make it just return the, the reverse of the list and not actually adjust the list itself, but this does have the side effect. It actually reverses the list. And I'll just show you one more. If you wanted to remove the first occurrence of an item, you could do L dot remove and then that item. So we'll do three there. And again, this has a side effect. If you ask what L is now, it's that same list, but that three is missing. If at any time you want to know other things you can do with a list, just look up the documentation. I'm certainly not gonna cover every single possibility here. I am gonna write some purposely complex code just to get you used to some more confusing things sometimes. So I'll do a new list. We'll do L is now equal to this empty list and we'll build this up. So we'll say for I in range of five and then for J in the range of three. And then I'm gonna say if I plus J mod two is equal equal to zero, and I'm gonna put brackets around here what makes sense. If I plus J modulo two is equal to zero. So what does this mean? Well, if something mod two is equal to zero, that actually means that it's an even number. And so we're gonna do if I plus J is an even number, then what I want to do is L dot append, I will do I 
plus j. Okay, so at the end of all of this, we have that l is 0, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, and then 6. So what happened here is that, well, i is going to take on the values 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. But for each of those values of i, so first when i is 0, well, j is going to be 0, then 1, then 2. Then after all of that, well, then we're going to make i go to 1, and then again, j is going to be 0, then 1, then 2. So I'm not going to explain this whole thing. I'm purposely showing some complex code, and I want you on your own, if you're able to, to try and diagnose this block of code and try and see why it's returning this result. It's a really good practice, and I don't always just want to explain everything. It's good to do your own problems every now and then. Now I'm going to talk about the dictionary data type in Python. And it's very similar to the term dictionary that you probably already know. Basically, the original dictionary is you have a bunch of words, and those words have an associated definition or meaning to them. Now, it's pretty much the same thing in here, except instead of the word, we generally use the word key. And instead of the definition or, or meaning there, we use the word value. So instead of word meaning pairs or word definition pairs, we use the terms uh, key and value pairs, and we'll see why shortly. So I will first make a dictionary that closely emulates the dictionary that you do know, and we'll see that we can make it a lot more general and useful than this, but we can do this if we wanted to. So we will do uh, this curly braces here, you have to use that, and then we'll use the string of apple like that, and then we'll put a colon to say the associated definition with that apple is, uh, we'll do a string of, actually I'll do double quotes, so I can do, it's a fruit, sorry, I'll move that, it's a fruit that is high in uh, vitamin C. Okay, so some sort of a definition for that, and actually for now I'll just make that the entire dictionary. Okay, so it's literally a dictionary with one word and uh, one meaning for that, but that's fine for now. And since it's a dictionary, I will call it uh, D, so make that a variable. D is equal to that dictionary, and uh, we'll output D. It just outputs right back as it was before. So let's look up the definition of apple. So we do that with D, and then I usually write sub here. It's just a lookup by the key, we call this the key. So we insert a key here and we'll say D sub apple. Okay, so what is that? Well, it's going to return its associated value. Okay, so we call this the key and we call this its associated value. So this is asking, what is the value associated with this key? And that is, well, it's a fruit that's high in vitamin C. We could of course have multiple words in our dictionary and I'll just adjust the one we have over here. Since I'm out of room, I'm gonna place a new line, but we do we separate them by commas and then just since I'm out of room, I'll do an enter there. It doesn't mind that at all. And we will do say uh, banana. So this is, I guess this is gonna be a fruit dictionary. So banana, uh, we'll say it's, uh, it's a fruit that is high in potassium. I am pretty sure that's true. So potassium right there. And uh, we'll just run that again. And now it outputs showing both of those things. If we were to look D sub apple, what's the value? Well, that hasn't changed. And we can look up D sub, I'll just put it in here, D sub banana. And that is, well, that's the value there. If you wanted to change your mind about the value of one of these things, like you as the owner of this dictionary, you actually said, hey, hey no, that the definition of banana is changing over time. Uh, let's change it. And so we could do uh, pretty similar to that list syntax where we gave uh, like the list and then the index and we modified that. Well, we can do D sub, we'll change the definition of banana. So we'll have to say D sub banana. Uh, we changed our mind. It is actually equal to uh, its a vegetable. Okay, I think that's actually technically true anyway. I mean, it is a fruit, but apparently fruit is like a subclass of vegetable. I don't know. It's a vegetable that uh, it still is high in potassium. Okay, so we'll do that. And then we should see D now outputs as apple stayed the same, but banana, uh, it had an updated value. If we decided that we actually didn't uh, want banana to be even in the dictionary, we're like, hey, no, 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 the word banana is banned. And so we're going to delete uh, D sub banana. Okay, that's how you do it. It's a little bit of a weird syntax and you might see this uh, in other places too, but we delete D sub banana and you'll see that D now only has the definition for apple. 
if you wanted to add a word into the dictionary and instead of just doing it like at the beginning here this is basically you you know constructing the dictionary in the beginning if you wanted to do it afterwards and say hey there's actually this new fruit uh, it's called a cucumber so d sub cucumber and uh, we will set that it's the same syntax as modifying a key. It's literally doing the same thing. Uh, we're just saying that d sub this key, so its associated value, is going to be uh, this is a long cylindrical, I don't even know how to spell cylindrical, cylindrical, let's go with that, uh, fruit with um, a boring taste because it's okay, but you know, it's not amazing. So d sub cucumber, this is a long cylindrical fruit with a boring taste. If we were to do output D, well, then it still would not have that banana. It does have apple, and now it has cucumber as well. If you wanted to go through all of the items in a dictionary, well, you could do that with for, I'll do it like for K in the D dot keys. So that means we're going through each of the keys. And so that means to get the associated value, well, we'll set V equal to uh, the D sub K, because, you know, if the K is each of the keys, well, V for the value is the associated D sub key. And we will just for fun print K and V. And this will look very similar to before. Apple, it's a fruit that's high in vitamin C. And cucumber, this is a long cylindrical fruit with a boring taste. I will let you know there is certainly other ways to loop through a dictionary as well, but this is the one that I usually do. There is technically no limitation on what a value may be in a dictionary. So up here at the top, you know, this could have been an integer, this could have been uh, an instance of a human class, this could have been uh, human, the class itself. There's really no limitation there, but uh, the limitation is definitely on the keys here. The keys have to be what we call hashable, and uh, I'm not really going to give you a formal definition of what is hashable, but pretty much all of the time you are going to make them either a string or an integer, and you generally keep the same data type throughout. So it's pretty rare that you'd have like say, this key is apple and this key is the number four. Technically you could, uh, but generally you'll see that the keys are either all strings or the keys are either all integers. And there is some very rare instances where you might hash what we call hash on something else. But uh, those are the two most common ones by far. So just to show you what that might look like, we could make another dictionary. I'll call it D2 equal to uh, zero. And then we'll say Greg. So Greg is in uh, associated with key zero, whatever that means. And then one, well, that is associated with, uh, we'll say Sarah. Okay, so maybe this is some sort of uh, like a rank. Okay, so Greg is the top, you know, zero is the top. Of course, you know, Greg's at the top. That just, you know, that makes a logical sense that I'm the best, better than everyone else. Not really. Um, two is going to be uh, maybe this person called uh, Tom. I don't know. Okay, so a new dictionary where they are integers and their values are you know, strings. That wasn't required, but I chose that. And then D2 is going to be just like you'd expect. And you could look up uh, D2 sub any key. So say one, who is in the one spot there. Well, that is Sarah. And that's a dictionary with integers. That's really all I'm gonna show you with dictionaries. There's a little bit more you could do with them, but to be honest, that's all you're really gonna ever be doing with them, putting stuff in them and then asking what are the values. They are extremely useful, they are extremely fast, and although it might not seem like they're super interesting, they are incredibly valuable because this lookup operation, looking up an associated value corresponding to that key, it is tremendously fast, no matter how big the size of the dictionary is. And so if you had like a massive, massive dictionary, it would still be tremendously fast to look up the associated value corresponding to a key. So that's why we use them. They're super useful for that simple task. Uh, and the notation, like the syntax, is really easy as well. We're now going to look further into strings. So a string is a class, or you could make a string object just like anything else. And we will do what's called an F string now. Okay, so an F string, basically it's a format string. You literally write F and then a string. And so we will do, say, hey, and then in braces here, name how is it going question mark now as is this is not going to work it'll say hey this name variable is not defined we don't have a variable called name and so we are going to set name equal to this string of greg and then when we run this it then says hey greg how's it going because in these braces here it actually runs python code and it says oh okay uh name you wanted the string of greg and so i'll put it in there 
I'm going to add to this a little bit more. And so I will do my favorite number is and then a number. So we'll put in braces again, and we'll put uh, a variable name. Okay, so what about, uh, say, I'll just write fav underscore num, and we'll make that a variable above fav underscore num is equal to any number. That's all I'm trying to demonstrate here. 23, if we run this, it is actually okay with that. It replaces fav num here with 23, and that means it's actually okay printing this all as a string with 23 in the string. Although that might not seem super interesting, remember earlier, if we did try to do something like my favorite number is, so some string, and then we did plus here, plus fav num, well, that doesn't work. You can't concatenate string uh, with an integer here, which is what we're trying to do, and yet it works up here. So why does that work? Well, I can show this visually very easily. If we change this from number to person, so that if I put h, which we know is an object from way earlier, we made a variable h and made that equal to an object of class human, or it's an instance of class human. And so if we run this, it gets replaced with my favorite person is the H got replaced with a human with name Greg, their age is four. That is simply the call of that string method or the repr method and replaced between the braces right there. So that also shows us something that pretty much everything in Python is an object, even a number. If we literally just put four here, then that must be an object as well because what it must be doing is calling the string or represent method of this for here. Therefore, it is an object. So that's really, really cool in Python. Pretty much everything is an object. And so it works so easily because even something like a number, you can just call it string method and Python has told it what to do. It's kind of obvious for a number. You would obviously just replace it with the string of that number, but everything in Python is an object and it works so clean because of that. So that's super cool. I am just going to replace that with H again, because I think it's better leaving the notebook as that. And then I am going to copy this line to show something very similar to F strings, but I usually find slightly less useful, although occasionally it is used. You could do a string dot format. So if I write this dot format, well, this must be a method on the string class dot format. And I'm going to put for now, uh, we'll do the same things. We'll put name and H and we will do change this to zero and this to one. That is actually going to output exactly the same thing. The name goes into that zero slot. So we get, hey, Greg, and one, my favorite person is, this is the first slot. And so that goes right there. Okay, so this is really the same thing, except instead of referring to these things as variable names. So here we put the variable name, we actually put the index uh, according to the format over here. And so this is the zero slot, it goes into there, the one slot, it goes into there, and with the same rules like the string or represent method. Now, the main reason you might use the format method over the, uh, the F string method is if you want to use these multiple times, because usually it is longer to physically write the variable name than to write the index. So zero index or one index. These are only one number and very rarely you would go into like, you know, double digits. So it's only one character to show these here, as opposed to writing the full variable name. It can look a little bit clunky sometimes if you have big variable names in there. So you would do a dot format and list all of them. And if you wanted to have multiple of them, you could do, hey, Greg, how's it going, Greg? And then I wouldn't have to write name twice. I'd only have name once over there. Greg from the zero slot would go in there both times. And so it's a little cleaner. All right, and I'm going to, well, speaking of clean, I'm going to clean that up, delete that, and then show you uh, some really useful things you can do with strings, starting with a for loop. If you wanted to loop through the characters one by one in a string, you could do for C in that string. So we'll do, uh, we'll say Greg, a quick one, for C in Greg. And so C is first going to be capital G, then R, then E, then G. So we will just do one at a time, print C. And so each time we have the character. Note that in Python, a single character uh, is still a string. In some languages, a single character is a fully different data type called like a char, which is just short for character. But in Python, um, we can actually show if you wanted, print the type of C. Each time uh, C will be a string and nothing different uh, than a longer string. 
Now there is a ton of methods for strings. And of course, if you wanted to look them up, well, you could easily do it with just help on a string. So help on the empty string here, that gives you, well, the whole class. Okay, there's all of this stuff here and you can look that up if you wanted to. I'm going to show you some of the most common ones and that is uh, the one I use probably most commonly is called split. And I can just show how that works. If we had my name is Greg and then we did dot split and we pass that the space string, what that does is gives a list where it's each of those members are, are the characters and then they're in order split by the thing that you passed here. So since there is spaces here, it said, oh, I'm going to separate this. I'll give this my to this, and then I'm going to look for the next space. We had it here, and so name goes into that spot, is goes here, Greg goes there. I think this is extremely useful. Another really useful one, especially for checking the input of a user, which we'll actually get to a little bit after this, uh, we can use the dot is numeric to check if something is represented as a number. So we could have, uh, well, Greg, dot is numeric is going to return false because Greg's not really a number. Uh, but what we do have, for example, is a 452 dot is numeric. Well, that is going to be true because that is a number as a string. But if we had something weird like four and then G and six, well, although there's a number in there, this still isn't really a number. So that's false as well. If you maybe wanted to do all lowercase, you could say, uh, hello there. And well, that's all, all lowercase already. So if we do dot lower, then that's not going to change anything. But if we did do, uh, maybe you had an accidental thing there and you wanted to convert it to lowercase, that would convert everything in this to lowercase. And so even if I did all this way, like hello, hello there in all capitals, well, that converts it all to lowercase. So we could do that, or you could do that dot upper. So that is going to do the opposite. And so this with this string does not change anything at all. It converts everything to uppercase, but it already is. So it doesn't do anything. We could have this uh, as say maybe lowercase letters there. It doesn't look lowercase, but it actually is just to make sure you see it. I'll put one there. And if we run that again, it converts everything to uppercase. Just like lists, strings have an index. They have an order. And so if you were to look at maybe the string S is uh, hello, we could look at S sub zero. And that is going to grab that uh, that first spot. Okay, so zero, one, two, three, four, like before. And so you could have S zero, S one, all the way up until S four, which is still uh, that number is going to be the length of this thing minus one. You could ask the length of a string, length of S is five. And so that's just like before. But something is very fundamentally different about strings than lists. Of course, one is a string and the other is a list. They're already different things. But one really different thing is that strings are what we call immutable and lists are what we call mutable. Mutable simply means changeable and immutable simply means not changeable. So if you wanted to change an item of a list, well, we saw that L is equal to the list of one, two. And then if you were unhappy with L sub zero, L sub zero, we'll set that equal to five and we'll see that L is changed to the list of five, two. If we try to do that with strings, we'll keep that same string S, which is hello. If we tried to do S sub zero, maybe we'll set that to a different character, set that to maybe the character T. So set that to T to make it to low, whatever that is. If you ask what S is, no, no, no. This first line here, this is an error. String object does not support item assignment. Strings are immutable. You cannot change a string. If you tried to change any character of any string, it will yell at you and say, you cannot do that. Once you have a string, it cannot be changed. You might be wondering, well, doesn't this change it? Like, aren't we taking this string and we're calling upper and that's changing that string? No, this is returning a new string. Okay, so that's that same thing at the beginning of side effect versus just returning something. This has no side effect. Okay, it's not changing this string at all. What it's doing is calling the string method or the upper method of a string. And what that string method is told to do, it says, oh, I'm going to return a new string. Okay, I'm not going to touch that original string. I am going to return a new string. And it is going to be the same string as the original string, except it's going to be all uppercase. No side effect. It's not modifying this, so there's no error. It returns something, hence it shows up in this output here. 
Speaking of mutable versus immutable objects, we are now going to look at the tuple object, and it's going to look strikingly similar to a list, extremely similar. If we do round brackets, that's really the only difference other than what I'm about to say, round brackets and then say zero, one, so comma in between, we'll say T because it's a tuple. T is this tuple of zero, one. It outputs very similar to a list. It is zero and one. Just like a list, if you were to access the, say, first element, t sub 0, well, again, this is 0 index, this is 1 index, so that is going to return 0, t sub 1, that is going to return 1, and then if you were to loop through this thing, if you said, we'll say for item in t, and if we print item, well, first it is 0, and then it is 1. So this looks exactly the same thing as a list, but Tuples are immutable. Remember, lists are mutable. You can change items in them. You can also, you know, add to that list. You can subtract to that list. You can change the list for a tuple. And same with strings. You cannot change this thing. There is no fundamental way to change a tuple or a string without causing an error. And I would show this by saying maybe t sub zero. I'll change my mind about that. Make that a five it is going to throw that error. Tuple object does not support item assignment. Almost exactly the same thing as it said for the string. Strings and tuples are immutable. So then why would we even want tuples to exist? Because, you know, lists are basically the same thing, except they are more flexible since you can, you know, mutate them since they have, uh, you know, an option to change them. Why would we not prefer that over a tuple, which is immutable in Python? Well, really the reason they exist I guess there's multiple reasons, but the main reason is that you would actually want sometimes uh, the fact that you can't change the item in a tuple. It is secure. You know, it's uh, we do this in C and C++ a lot, where you basically make things constant, and it's for protection. It's so you can't change things. We're telling people, no, 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 there's no way to change this thing. It's secure. Whereas in a list, I guess you could consider that a little bit more risky because you know if you're not super careful, you could change the items of that. Whereas in a tuple, that will throw an error and there's really no way to hide that. One extra thing, which is sorted. So sorted will take uh, many different types of objects, but it's most obvious. I'll just say a list of numbers, a list of two, then one, then four. That will return, so again, not uh, not mutate. It will not do a side effect. It will return the list of one, two, four, which is that same list sorted. One more to go through here. I'm actually going to put it before the sorted. And so if we were to ask what is a set in mathematics, we would get the answer of it is an unordered. So there's no sort of order to it. It's not this, then that, then that. It is an unordered, you know, just a bunch of different things without duplicates. They could be numbers, they could be strings. The main point is that there's no order and there's no duplicates. So what that means is I could have the set of uh, numbers here, one and then one, and then two, and then negative four, we could have those in a set, and these are braces, okay? So note, this is the set. Why is it using braces when that's for dictionaries? Well, it knows not to do the dictionary because it doesn't have these key, uh, that colon thing there, it doesn't have key colon value, it just has numbers or items separated by commas. So it knows this is a set, and it outputs as the set of negative four, one, and two. So note that it did choose to actually sort it for us, but that doesn't really matter. It's an unordered set, uh, and it took the duplicate away here because we had two ones, and then it actually simplified it to just one, and that makes sense. It's, a, it's representing a mathematical set. It doesn't have duplicates. We don't have one and one, we just have one. Now, for this video, I don't really want to show all of the different things you can do with sets, or, or even most of them. The biggest thing that you would do with a set, I would guess, is to remove duplicates. So basically, if you had, say, uh, say the string of Greg is a great guy, okay, a lot of G's in that sentence. Well, basically, if we converted this to a set, and you can do this with simply writing set, that really calls the constructor of a set, like we saw with that human class, we'll make a set out of this string. And what that does uh, is it converts it to a set. And so, you know, you can see the braces there without the colons, a set of all the different letters, including space there, and it only has C one G. Okay, so it's removing all of the duplicates from that. Something really, really common you kind of do is uh, say have like a list of numbers and only want uh, you know, the individual uh, elements of those and no duplicates. So if you had, say, the list of one, one, two, two, 
three, uh, negative five, six, four, and you wanted only the uh, you know one occurrence of those, you could just make that a set in Python. And so now that is uh, going to remove all of those duplicates. Now, since braces are shared by both dictionaries and sets, I just wanna show you if you were to start off with the, the empty either dictionary or set, well, that is actually, what is that? <laughs> that, that is actually uh, the dictionary, okay? So if you ask the type of this, uh, this empty thing here, then it is actually a dictionary and not a set. And therefore, if you did want the empty set, you actually have to write just set like that, and that will produce the empty set. Those are all the important data types in Python. For integers, you would use the int type. For decimal numbers, you would use the float type. For uh, logically true or false things, you would use the Boolean type. For uh, functions, we also have the function data type as well. For strings, like for outputting things, for uh, storing things like text and passwords, you would use that uh, as a string. We have sets, which basically store, uh, you know, one unique copy of everything. If there, if you don't want duplicates, you'd use a set. If you wanted to store many different things and have an order associated with that, you would probably put that in a list. And so they're very, very flexible, store any different type, uh, and it keeps the order of those lists are great for that. If you had some sort of a key value lookup, you would use a dictionary. And uh, I, unless I missed anything there, that is all the things that we talked about. Uh, of course, there's also classes and technically everything in Python is, a, is an object of class something, uh, but uh, you don't really need to worry about those fine details. Those are all the important data types in Python and the reason you might use them. Okay, looking back a little bit earlier, we saw this tuple error type error, tuple object does not support item assignment. If you were to try and change one of those items of a tuple, well, tuples are fundamentally immutable, meaning that you cannot change them. And so they will raise this error if you try to. What I told you was that, well, we'd use tuples because they're safe. And so, you know, if you try to change something here, Python will break and tell you. Well, actually, I'm gonna tell you that that's not completely true. If you were to write code that looked like this, I'll just write a new tuple, T is uh, the tuple of one, two, and three. What we could do is if we wrote try, so we'll try to do, uh, we'll set T sub zero equal to one. Well, we know that that's gonna throw an error. That still always will throw an error, but uh, hey, except, except if we have an exception, which is another term for uh, error here, if we have an exception or error, well, then what I'm gonna do is just say, for now, uh, we caught it. So basically, we caught it meaning that we did not actually, uh, you know, break Python. We still raised an error. We still, we still threw an error here. Something bad happened, but we caught it because we had it in this try accept thing. We tried to do this and it said, whoa, whoa, this is trying to break Python, except it's in this try accept thing. And so it actually goes down and runs what's in here, except if we have an exception, if we have an error, we will do this. And so it didn't break Python. It did not halt all execution. It halted all execution over here, jumped out and then printed it. And so just to show you that it really did halt all execution, if we did try to do print uh, print hello here, well, then it's not, uh, it's not actually going to ever print that. But if we have a, a print something else up here, print say hi, well, we are definitely going in there. We try, we print hi, we raise this error here, it jumps immediately out. It does not print that hello. It prints hi, it throws that error, it jumps to the accept. Because we had an error, it prints caught it, and then it's uh, it's done after that. We could actually get a little bit more specific with this exception thing here. We could do accept type error, okay? So what that does is it's going to do exactly the same thing because the type of error that this is raising is a type error, and we saw that over here type error. It's just in capitals like that. The tuple object does not support item assignment. Since this particular code is throwing that particular type of error, it's throwing a type error, well, we caught that particular type of error. But if we tried to accept a different error here, say something which we know exists is a syntax error. I'm sure we had one of those earlier. If you tried to accept that, well, hey, we're still going to get the error and break Python type error, tuple object does not support item assignment. We still broke Python here and we didn't have an accept to jump into because this is only catching a syntax error. It's not catching a, a type error. It would if you had type error there and it also would catch any type of error 
if you just had accept, but that particular one did not catch that particular error. Something kind of weird, and I use this example on purpose, because if you did actually accept syntax error, and you actually did have a syntax error over here, like say, uh, like a triple equal sign, four equal signs, sure, with nothing over here, this is very much a syntax error. And uh, what's weird is that it actually still shows up as a syntax error. Uh, this is just a different thing in Python. And so, you know, this would work for many different types of errors in Python, but the syntax error one, that actually is not gonna work. Now there is definitely more you could look into on the error handling in Python, but I find that for the vast majority of applications, knowing those things like try, accept, and accept an error, that is going to solve the vast majority of your problems. We saw earlier how we could get input from a file, so we could read from files. Now, as part of our program, we're gonna see how we can immediately just request the user gives us information. So we can do that with the input keyword, and we can store the result in a variable. So we will do this with, uh, we'll make a variable called result. We'll set that equal to input. And then here, we're going to give a, a basically background information string. So we're gonna say like, hey, uh, hey, please give us a number. It's something that's just gonna pop up for them so that the, the user knows like, oh, okay, this is what they want, or this is some background information. So we give them that, and when we run this, I haven't run it yet, but when we run this, it is going to immediately get stuck on this. It's going to output this to the, the terminal, and it's going to sit there waiting for us to give them uh, to give a response. Once we give that response, it will be stored in a string object, and it will be stored in this result. We should then be able to print our result, and I'm actually going to do a, a nice F string for that, print F, uh, the result is and then result, and then just period. We will close that up, and I run this. It is going to sit there waiting here. Hey, please give us a number. It's gonna sit here waiting. I'll click in here, give it say 32. I press enter. That stores it in result as a string that we print the result is result, and it is 32. So as I said, it would be stored in a string. And so we saw earlier, like this actually doesn't need it to be a string. The F string allows it to be any object and it just calls that string method. But if we do ask the type of result, we will see that it's always gonna get stored in a string. But I said, hey, please give us a number. How can we check if it's actually is a number since they gave us a string? Well, you might recall the is numeric method of a string. We can just do result dot is numeric and then in this case it is going to be true because we did give a number but if we ran this again and then gave something weird like a high well that's not what we requested but all of this is still going to work just fine down here we can evaluate or evaluate it and say hey no 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 this is false and so i'm not going to show you the code but combining this idea with the try accept is a very very common way to handle user interfaces or kind of the the direct code after a user interface to take the input and then check if it's something that we want. If it is, then you know proceed. If it is not, then we might wanna jump out and tell the user like, hey, that's, a, that's not something we wanna do. I'd now like to show you probably my favorite thing in Python, and it's why I use it so much, is because of this thing called list comprehension. Now, it's basically a way to make lists very quickly. You'll find in Python, you want to use lists for a whole bunch of things. And now, yeah, if you wanna make them quickly, this is the way to do it. So if you write it like this, we'll do L to store it in a variable. L is equal to the list, so we'll do it like this, of x for x in range five okay so this is really the simplest thing that you can do think about what this is so x for x in range five well for x in range five that means x is going to be well first zero then one then two then three then four and we're just making the list x for each of those so this list is going to be zero then one then two then three then four and so it is the list of those numbers if we output l then it is going to be those numbers that by itself, not really super useful. But if you make it slightly more complicated, it is really useful. So for example, we could take that same code here, put it down here, but then simply replace this with, I'll choose to do to the power of two. So now this is x squared for x in range five. Well, x every time, that's not gonna change. That's still gonna be zero, then one, then two, then three, then four. But here, we're actually making the list itself. First, it is 
zero squared, and then it's one squared, then two squared, three squared, and four squared. So that L this time is, well, that's exactly what those are, but with their actual values. Zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. I love this stuff. Check this one out. We can also add if statements. So I'll copy that original code again and replace it with x for x in range five, only if, uh, we'll put in brackets, x mod two is equal equal to zero. And now what that is, is zero, two, and four. So this actually changed the size of it as well, because yes, it's x for x in range five, so still x is going to be first zero, then one, then two, then three, then four, but we are actually only putting an element in here if this side. So we're only doing that if x mod two equals equals zero, as in if x is an even number, then we'll make it x. Okay, so first it's zero, and then x is one, except, well, this is going to be false, and so we don't ever put one there. Then x is two, and so this is going to be true, and therefore we get two there, we get x is three, well, that's not gonna show up, but x is four, well, that is going to show up, and so we get zero, two, four the even numbers only. Do note the order here. I put the if over here. What would happen if we actually had the if over here? So x if x mod two equals equals zero for x in range five. Well, that says invalid syntax. But what's weird about this is if you were to do an else, we could actually replace this with an else x for x in range five if x mod two equals equals zero else else. So if this is going to be false, then we will replace it with, we'll just say five to make it very, very clear. And if we run that, this is also invalid syntax. But if you place this over here, and now if you put the if over here, x if x mod two equals equals zero, else five for x in range five, then that's gonna be what we wanted. So first we get zero because this is true the first time. Then when x is one, well then this is gonna be false. And so we get a five there, there's the five. If x is two, then this is going to be true. And so we get two. If x is three, well, then this is false and we get another five. And then finally, for the last value in that range, when x is four, this is true. And so this shows up as four. Now, the reason this is so powerful and therefore I use it all the time is because I, this is actually scarcely just range. You could use this as whatever you wanted for anything reasonable where you're using a for loop through that. So for example, the list of four, one, six, and 12. Well, we could go through that, make a list out of it, and I'll, I'll let you check for yourself why you would get this specific result. Some quick tools that does not count as list comprehension, but I also use all the time is say, if you had the list of zero times five, well, that actually makes the list of zero times five. And so that could be a nice shorthand you would use sometimes. You could also add lists together. So say one and two plus the list of five and four and seven. That is the same as string concatenation, but list concatenation, it puts them together in one list. Combining stuff like this, multiplication, addition, using this list comprehension, you can very, very quickly, both like, you know, syntactically, you can actually write very little code. And in Python, they have this optimized really, really well, so that making these complex things is very fast. And I think this is the main reason why Python is used over many other languages, is because stuff like this, which comes up a lot, especially in data science and analytics, but all over the place, you can make these complex objects very, very easily. And once you get kind of comfortable with this, then it's, it's just, you know, I, it's hard to switch to another language for me. We can actually take this even further and I'll show you first the zip function so that we can do that. If we do for A and B, so a comma there for A and B in, we'll do the zip of range of three and range of four to seven, okay? We do that and very similar just to like, you know, there's a single range here. We'll do in the zip of these things. And then if I print A and B in here, it'll show you zero and four, one and five, two and six. This essentially allows us to loop through multiple things at the same time. A is going to loop through this first piece, range of three, and so it takes on the values zero, then one, then two, but at the same time and not like after, at the exact same time, B is going to be going through range of four to seven, which is four, five, and six. So the first time this loop runs, it is A is zero and B is four, 
then this loop runs again and so a is going to be the next thing a is going to be one and then b will be the next thing b will be five it runs one more time and so a is two b is five and that's done it runs three times not like a is doing this and then b is going to do this after it is doing it at the exact same time guess what we can use list comprehension here as well if we copy basically this exact thing here well, look at the earlier list syntax. We had the, we'll just look at this one, x something, 4x in this range. Well, there's no reason we can't have two members of this. So we will do the list of, not just that, but the tuple of a and b for a, b in this zip. And then we get the list of the tuple of 0, 4, 1, 5, and 2, 6. This syntax along with, you know, all these functions like zip and there's lots more for you to discover on your own. You can do some really crazy things. Speaking of crazy things, we can actually do this for dictionaries too. If you wanted to build up a weird dictionary, you could basically take this exact piece, except then replace this with, well, the dictionary. So that's for list, square bracket is for list. This is for dictionary, except a dictionary takes key value pairs. So it's going to need well, a colon b, for example, that's one way to do it. We need to go through two things. And so for a and b in this zip, we'll make a each time the key, b each time the value. Now we get a dictionary instead of the tuples. I'll get back to this very shortly, but I wanna take a quick aside and talk about something called ASCII or A-S-C-I-I. -I. Essentially, every character in a computer is uh, actually stored as an integer or an ASCII integer. And so there's actually a one-to-one -one mapping here. You can take any character and map that to an integer and you can take that same integer and you can map it back to get that same character, okay? So essentially what we need to know is that if you use chur in Python, this is assuming you pass it an ASCII integer. If you do chur of 65, that actually happens to be an ASCII, the capital A. And if you do chur of 97, well, that is lowercase a. Those are the only two that I have memorized, and that's really the only two that you should probably have memorized as well. So this one is assuming that you have the integer and you want to get the ASCII character. If you needed to go the other way around, you would use ORD. And so we would do ORD of capital A should return 65 and ORD of lowercase a better give 97. Okay, so that's really all we need to know about that. A very quick conversation. And we're going to use that along with the dictionary comprehension to make the alphabet as a dictionary very, very quickly. So for that, all we really need to know is these pieces and that they go up one by one. Meaning if we have char of 65, that is capital A, but char of 66, that is capital B, char of 67 is capital C. And if you have char of capital, sorry, char of 97, you get lowercase a. And again, it goes up char of 98 is lowercase b. And that will continue to go up as well. Okay, so with knowing only that, we can actually use this dictionary syntax to get the alphabet uh, mapped to their order. Okay, so we'll do that now. I'm just going to copy that in and we'll change that shortly. Now, not that it really matters, but just for my clarity, I want to put this as K and this as V because it's K and V for key and value. Technically, it does exactly the same thing, but it, uh, it makes it a little bit clearer. Now, what I want to do is make a mapping from uh, the position. So we'll actually make it start at one and then be two and then be three instead. So one, two, three up until 26, mapping the character's uh, order to that character in the alphabet. And we could do either lowercase or uppercase, it doesn't really matter. But uh, let's use chur and ord in order to do that. Well, let's first figure out the keys and worry about the values later. So we would need the keys to be, we'll do 1 to 26 inclusive. And so we will make this 1 to 27, because actually it does start at 1 and include that, but it only goes up until this minus 1. So then we have 1 to 26. If we run that, it's actually going to only do one, two, and three. And that's because this is actually stopping us at the length of this here. That's a, that's what zip does. It's, it's actually not gonna break if these two are different lengths. Here, this is 26 length, and this is length of three. It actually stops at the minimum length so that it's not going to do anything crazy. Uh, and so we can actually just change this for now. This is not our final product, but if we make this matching one and 27, well, then this is simply one to one, two to two, three to three, all the way up until 26 to 26. 
All right, so I'm happy with our keys, but I'm not happy with our values. What we need to do with the values is actually, we don't actually need to use zip here at all, which is kind of crazy because we are just going to make v a function of k. It doesn't need to loop through something itself. It is just gonna be a function of k and we'll see that. So k to v for k and v, no, for k in range of one to 27. If we simply make this, well, okay, is it gonna be ord or char? Well, char is the one that takes a number and that produces a letter. So we're gonna use char of, let's just do char of v for now, sorry, char of k for now. And that is, whoa, something crazy. That's because k is, we're actually getting uh, the char of one, char of two, and that's a bunch of weird stuff. If we do k plus, and then if we do say 64, well, we'll check out what that is. It starts at A because first K is one, and then it goes all the way from A, B, up until Z, matching totally with the alphabet because we are doing K plus 64. Okay, believe it or not, we are done learning new Python code in this video. I'm gonna finish it off with some really, really important pieces, so please watch this, otherwise you'll be missing some really vital information. We are going to talk about modules and how to set this up on your own computer, or at least on how to run Python files on any computer. Okay, we've only seen Google Colab, which is amazing for just base Python, but there's a little bit more to understand involving how to run these files, uh, what it means to actually have a Python file, which it's not hard, none of this is really hard, but it is really important to know, so please stick around for this. The first thing we're gonna talk about is a module in Python, and we've already seen one actually. We saw from copy, import, import, deep copy. Okay, so essentially what this is, copy is actually a module, and deep copy is a, either a function or a class in, uh, in the library. It doesn't even matter to us. The point is that we can grab stuff from a library like this, or if we actually wanted to, we could import the library as import copy, and then if you wanted to give a name to that as CP. So now we have access to that library through CP, and if we wanted to do a deep copy, you could do A is equal to the list of one, two, and three, and then B is equal to CP dot deep copy of A, and then B is going to be the list of one, two, three, and of course, as we saw, A is B, well, that is gonna be false. One of the main reasons why Python is so universally accepted is because it has a massive ecosystem of libraries or modules. And so this one, this copy, this is actually considered a built-in library to Python. It is installed by Python uh, by default, but it is kind of hidden in this copy module. There are also many, many libraries, such as say NumPy, which do not exist in Python by default. And yet, I'll show you in Google Colab, you still have access to it, import numpy as np, and you could do, uh, we'll just show np outputs as the module to show you it does exist. In Colab, many, many, many new uh, common libraries that are not in Python by default are already installed. In fact, if you wanted to list at all of the modules that were installed, well, you would have to talk to pip, which uh, is basically Python's package manager. It manages these modules and, and stores them on the computer in a way that uh, Python will understand. So we can actually talk to pip with exclamation pip and then list. So you talk to pip through just this, but we are doing here, uh, what we're doing here is listing, listing all of the libraries that are default uh, installed into Google Colab because I have not touched this at all. Now, if you were to run this, you may get a different list than me, but this should still work. For me, I get TensorBoard with uh, version 2.8 and TensorFlow and uh, so many other libraries that you'll find uh, a lot of them have to do with data science and machine learning because Colab was mainly started as data science and machine learning. But I think regardless of who you are, Python is very, very easy to be used on Colab and I think it's phenomenal for learning. So that's why I chose to use it in this lecture. But anyway, we can see all of these libraries that are installed by default. And, uh, and so this is in Google Colab. 
If you were to do this in your kind of own environment, if you installed Python on your own computer and you ran the same thing, pip list, well, you would get a much, much smaller list, probably only four to five items. So Google Colab has all of this stuff installed already. If you're trying to manage your modules in Google Colab right here, please watch my video on Google Colab. And if you are trying to do it on your own environment, well, I would first watch this video if you're not familiar with it already. And then after that, I would watch the Python version virtual environments video, which shows you pretty much the proper way to handle packages on your computer. As a stepping stone before we go to the local computer and worry about the environment there, we are going to make our first Python script on Google Colab. So we can do that in our file system over here. I will make a new file and I will call it uh, test.py. So Python files end in py. So it's say just test.py. We're going to double click to open that. And here we have that same editor as before. So what would you put in a Python script file right here? What would you put in here? Well, it's a program. It does whatever you would want it to do. And uh, we're gonna put Python code in here. Now, the only difference between writing code in these files versus writing code in our notebook, which we've used for, you know, like basically three hours now, the only real difference is here, this thing is still gonna run top to bottom and follow all of the same rules that we've seen but it is not going to have our variables open uh, to look at later because over here in our variables, we can see we have A and B and L and num and all of these variables. And I can right now ask you what those are. Like if I wanted to check what num was, it's still stored as this, but in this Python file, it'll still run top to bottom. It'll still follow all of the same rules, except is just going to run and then close. And you're not gonna have some access to your variables. That really is the only difference. But I will make a very simple Python script file. Say for example, we had the list L is equal to the list of one, two, and three. And then uh, maybe I'll get some input from the user. I'll store that in the variable U. U is equal to input, give them a prompt and say, uh, give us a number, please. Okay, pretty much like before we would store that in a string u. Okay, so we have that there. How do we know it's a number? Well, we can check if, uh, if sorry, not like that. If u dot is numeric, we will only go into here if u is numeric, if it's a number. So we will say uh, in here, print, thank you, thank you for the number. And then we'll put that number in braces here, and that should be, and you like that, sorry, I, should, I have to put an F there. So we will print that, thank you for the number, if they did give us a number, but if they did not, well, then we would go into this else here and we would say, uh, hey, hey, why didn't you give us a number? Question mark, question mark, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. That is a simple Python script file and, uh, and it should do this, okay? So it'll make this list, it will, uh, it will make this, uh, this input from the user It'll be, if it's a number, then we'll write this with the number. If it's not, we'll be like, what the heck are you doing? Uh, and I didn't actually do anything with the list, but of course we could have. So I'm gonna save that with control S and, uh, and we'll see how to run that file here. Now, like anything about files, you have to know where they're stored. Well, luckily I'm making this easy for us. If we do exclamation LS, well, then they are directly available to us here. And so now we just need to figure out how can we run test.py? Well, it's actually really easy. You can just do this exclamation and then Python and test.py. And that is going to run our program. Give us a number, please. I will give it say 45, enter. And it said, thank you for the number 45. There's our Python program. We don't have access to our variables. It just ran top to bottom and that's it. But that's how you make a Python program. Sometimes we ourselves write some really awesome Python code that we want to borrow elsewhere. Say, for example, a class, okay? The main reason we write classes is so that we can use them multiple times or all over the place, we might want to make instances or objects from that class. So for example, that human class, when well, we did have access to human with uh, right here in Jupyter Notebook, uh, we have human right there. But in our, in our test file here, in our Python script, this would have no access to our human class. Of course, if you wanted to put it there, well, you could literally, and I already copied it beforehand, you could literally just paste in that class right there. And uh, as long as you fix up the indentation and make it look proper, then yeah, you would have access to that too. But there's gotta be a better way than just literally pasting it in there. 
Well, we're not gonna paste it in here. We're gonna paste it in its own file. When we have code that we want to use in multiple places, we generally put that in its own file, or at least a bunch of things in one file. We are going to make a human file. So human, it's gonna be Python, human.py. Since it has Python code, it's still gonna be .py. And in this file, well, I copied it again earlier, we can just paste in that human class right there, okay? As long as all of the indentation is right, we should save that and have that in its own file. Then in test.py, since these are in the same uh, folder here, we have test.py and human.py in the same folder. Well, in here, I can go ahead and do from human, so human in lowercase, well, that's matching with the file name here. So from, from file name here, without the pi, from human import, well, what do we call it? We called it human. Okay, so now in this file here in test.py, we do have access to that human class. Before we would not, but now we do. So just to show you that, we could do print, uh, we'll print a human. And actually, we're not, we're not gonna make a particular human. We'll simply print the class human. It doesn't really mean much, but it shows you that we've been able to import the human class. And so now if we go to do this again, Python test.py, give us a number, please. We'll give it 45 and then it does that. And then it, it does show that we've outputted the class human, okay? So this is how we kind of reuse code, okay? The, there's another term for this. It's like writing modular code in Python here. When we have code that we'd want to reuse, you'd often give it, to, give it its own file or put multiple things in these files. And then from a different file, you would go and uh, do from, from that file name, we'd import whatever we wanted to import. That way you wouldn't have to write it multiple times, but you still have access to it. To finish this video off, I want to do what probably most people would have done in the first few seconds. I want you to go download Python, whatever version makes sense for you right now. I wouldn't recommend the most up-to-date version, usually like 0.2 lower than that. So if right now it's a, it's Python 3.10, then maybe use 3.8. If it's a, you know, some other version, maybe just go a little bit less than the maximum is usually a good idea. And download Python on your computer, install that, and I want you to make sure that you have access to that on your computer, okay? So I have a very minimal computer here. You can see I did a cleanup recently. You should be able to, and I'm assuming Windows, but uh, if you are on Mac, then you know this is where we'll look a little bit different. I want you to be able to get into a terminal and you should open that. This looks a little bit different because I'm using the Windows terminal. doesn't really matter. Here I am in the desktop. I'm actually going to make a folder. I will just make a, uh, a test folder. So I'll just call that test. And then if I write dir here for macro Linux, it would be ls like we saw on Colab. Dir should show that we have that test folder. I will do a cd, it's cd for both Linux and Mac and uh, Windows, cd into test. So now my working directory in this terminal is in that folder there. Now what I wanna do is just in these folders or in that folder, I want to have those two files that we already created on Colab. You have two options, you can either uh, download them directly from Colab and and just put them in right there, or you can just make a new file uh, and and put those put the contents in as well. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to show you how to do that in the first method. Okay, so those files should be there now and they should look exactly the same. Here for me, you can, it's giving this symbol. Uh, it's actually going to open up with VS Code. That's the editor that I have chosen for this. You can use whatever editor you want uh, or even just simply NumPad, uh, like Notepad is not that bad, although it's not great. Notepad++ is a little better, but as long as you can see the code here uh, and you can, uh, you can read it well, then it doesn't really matter. As long as it's showing up as uh, the same file names and it has the same contents, then you're good to go. So now we're gonna do exactly the same things that we did on Colab, and this is just in a different way. We should have access to Python as long as you installed Python. I'm not in this video and showing you how to do that. It's really easy, you just go and, uh, and go to python.org and you install the correct version. 
I'm not going to show you how to do that. Uh, I believe in my Python virtual environment video, I did show that a little bit, which I'm going to tell you to watch after this, uh, after this video, which is almost over. But for now, we will do Python, make sure you have access to Python through that, we should be in that folder that has those files test.py and human.py. And as long as you have Python test.py, and that does the same thing as it does on Colab, give us a number, please, we'll do 67. And that does that we output the class as well, showing that in the exact same way, we do have access to uh, the human class over here, because we import it over here. And, uh, and our program is done. Okay, so we did 99% of that on Colab, and you can see it's really all the same thing. The difference is that you don't have access by default here to the libraries on pip. And if I were to show you uh, pip list, well, that shows you whatever libraries that I have installed. Uh, but uh, feel free to go to my Python virtual environment video, where I explain more about the modules there. So uh, that is the end of the video. Wow, that was a long one. <laughs> um, yeah, I very highly recommend you watch the Python virtual environments video after this one. And if you are following my uh, data science pathway, then best of luck. Luckily, this is most likely the hardest video you'll ever see. Easily the most long. Uh, <laughs> took a long time for me to do too. I'm really happy for it to be over, but uh, that was a lot of fun. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, definitely subscribe to the channel if you really enjoyed this, and uh, and I'll see you in whatever video you decide next. I would choose the Python virtual environments video. That is probably the best place to go, since I didn't show you how to well, make virtual environments, which is the best way to actually uh, use Python well on your own computer. Okay, so uh, all right, bye-bye. <laughs>